<laughs> right, right. I know. I taught my first class in the middle of COVID and I had to experience that. Yeah, I know. Tough to get conversation yeah, going sometimes. Exactly. I thought it was good at this conversation. Yeah, exactly. I thought like that was one of my best presentations ever. <laughs> Get the chance to wear it much. It's a good time to. But but this. So wear. I haven't seen those before. Um, that's really classic. Yeah, she did a good job. With that. Yeah. All right. Heather doing all right. She is. She's. Uh, I wish she could have come there. Okay. Good morning, and welcome to the Madison Trust. We were just counting the years, and this is the, the ninth Madison Trust, um, which in and of itself has been an entrepreneurial, innovative endeavor. We're so glad that you're joining us uh, here today in person, and so many of you joining us um, online as well. And so I know there are many friends and former participants in Madison Trust who couldn't be here in person, so we love this, this new hybrid option that allows you to be here with us again today, along with those philanthropic investors who are here personally in the room. Um, we're in the festival boardroom, and, uh, and we are live streaming on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, we'll have some more information for you later this morning about the innovative day ahead. But for now, I'd like to introduce a special guest, uh, the sixth president of James Madison University, just finishing his 10th year here with us this morning is Jonathan Alger. Thank you, Nick, and good morning, everybody. Great, great to see you all. How many of you are here for the first time at Madison Trust? And if you're with us remotely, you can raise your hands too. So this is a participatory exercise. Great to have so many of you with us for the first time. And those of you that are returning, we really appreciate uh, you and your continued involvement and engagement with the university in this way. This is, as Nick said, uh, in itself an innovation, the Madison Trust, as we think about how to support all the goals and dreams that we have here at the university. And hopefully you'll get that sense today of that, that spirit of possibility that is so strong here at the university. But as you know, with, with those great ideas comes a need for resources. And so I'm really grateful to all of you for being here to hear about some of the great ideas from uh, people here in the university community, but that do need support 
and funding to be possible. And that's what's exciting about the Madison Trust is bringing together those different elements of our community. Uh, you'll ask, I know, a lot of good questions. You'll learn a lot, we hope, from this experience. It'll be great for the presenters as well. And at the end of the day, it will help to move the university forward in some new and exciting ways. And you all know we always talk about being the change here at the university, and that's what the Madison Trust literally helps us do with these projects. You know, sometimes it's just a, a relatively modest amount of funding that makes all the difference to get a great idea off the ground. And I, I look at the history of Madison Trust and so many great projects that have resulted from these conversations. And it's really exciting to see the difference that this event and all of you have made over the years and will continue to make as we go forward. Um, one quick thing I wanted to mention, how many of you know about the university's recent move to R2 status? Anybody? Or national university status? I know the staff people know. <laughs> Thank you, Bob, the deans. It's good that you know about it. Uh, I, I wanted to just highlight this because it relates directly to what we're doing here today with the Madison Trust. For those of you that uh, may not know what that lingo means of R2, the university was recently reclassified by what they call the Carnegie classifications of higher education from a master's level quote unquote regional institution to an R2 research doctoral national university. Now the reality is, as I was talking about with another group this morning, that's already who we are. This is simply catching up to what the university has already done and achieved and how we've evolved. But it's really important because what it says is that JMU now is fully taking its place on that national and international stage and is being recognized in that way. If you look at the rankings in US News and World Report, for example, we will change from being listed in that regional category, which for years has not really been an accurate description of JMU because we are a national university, but will now be in the same category with Harvard and Yale and Stanford and all the other research universities that you hear about. And that's a big deal. Uh, it, it changes uh, the nature of the university's attractiveness to a lot of people, to uh, students from across the country and internationally, to faculty uh, from around the country. And so we're really excited to have that uh, recognition, if you will, of, of how the university has grown and evolved. But very importantly, the fundamental character of JMU isn't changing. What do I mean by that? Our focus on undergraduates, our focus on the importance of teaching and learning is so critical. And a lot of these projects involve faculty engaging with students, including undergraduate students, with undergraduate research, and in other important ways that give them tremendous experiences as students. So our emphasis on the student experience, our focus on our students is not changing. But this creates new opportunities for us as a university. It means that we'll be more competitive for different types of grants and, and different types of collaborations and partnerships. But the Madison Trust will be a key part of this going forward because institutions at that level have involved and engaged alumni and supporters who care about the types of projects, the types of energy and innovations that you're gonna hear about today and find ways to get involved and engaged more than ever. And so this is where all of you come in. For us to be successful at this level, and I'm absolutely convinced we will be, we need your involvement and your engagement. You're gonna hear some great creative and innovative ideas today. I encourage you uh, to ask questions, to reflect on, on what you're hearing and to think about the, the potential for the future of this university. So thank you all. Thank you all so much for being here. This is what makes JMU great, is events like this. And I'm so glad to at least be back together in person with some of you, but also to be able to use the technology to connect with people that can't be here in person. And that's part, we talk about innovation, right? We've learned a lot during these last two years with the pandemic and being able to connect with all of you in this way is really exciting. So thank you all so much for being here. Unfortunately, I've got to run to the next meeting. Uh, but I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you for a few moments today and look forward to hearing the results of today's conversations. Thanks so much. Well, thank you so much, President Alger, again, for uh, being here and being such a supporter of the Madison Trust um, and a supporter and a champion of innovation uh, here for James Madison University. So um, today, 
for me has been a day that's always like going back to school. Uh, many of us have opportunities to uh, go to football games, maybe a basketball game, to the Forbes Center. I've been to two fantastic performances in the last few weeks at the Forbes Center, but so rarely do we get an opportunity to get back into that learning mode. And it's really all about access. We're getting access to some of the most brilliant minds thinking outside the box and really exploring the edge of what's possible um, through this Madison Trust. And for the faculty and, and staff who are the innovators, they have access to you. Savvy philanthropic investors who care about James Madison University, its future. And so um, there was a time that I, I read about a, a large campaign at a major university that was a billion dollar campaign. And uh, that campaign uh, was a great success, was in all the headlines, but some faculty were interviewed and they said, well, we heard about all these millions of dollars that they're raising, but I didn't see how it affected me. You know, this day gives access to any faculty member, any staff member with an innovative idea to come and be heard and share that innovation, have a chance to engage with savvy philanthropists like you. So it's a really extraordinary day of access. Um, you know, the Madison Trust specifically provides us opportunities to pilot new ideas, position new programs for success, develop intellectual property, um, and ensure that students reap the rewards of a forward-looking Madison experience. Um, speaking of innovation, just us being online and hybrid the way we are um, was an innovation. And it's one of those innovations that's here to stay. You know, this has allowed the reach of Madison Trust to go outside the bounds of this boardroom and to invite others to be a part of this day. And we're really, really excited about that innovation. Um, so no matter how you're participating, either live streamed or in person, your role is crucial uh, to the success of the day and to the possibilities, these innovative ideas really uh, catching fire. Um, today's projects, they've all been vetted. Uh, they've been vetted by philanthropists. This is the, this, these are the top ideas that made it to the final list. Um, they've gone through and practiced and received feedback. Um, so uh, you're seeing refined ideas and some of the top innovative ideas coming out of the academy um, this year. Unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, um, JMU's just not positioned to fund every innovative idea, even though we're hearing them just like you are and thinking, this is fantastic. Uh, we have a lot of constraints that face us, and that's where um, sometimes you have a present negative and a future positive, and philanthropy can make the difference and make that connection. And I, I believe the Madison Trust has shown us that over the years, time and time again. Um, in fact, $837,000. Um, have been given to 67 projects over the years. It's just fantastic investment. And it hasn't just touched, you know, one or two areas of campus. 30 different disciplines of campus have benefited from Madison Trust investment. Um, <clears throat> some of the successes of the past, um, many of you uh, may have heard about Rebound, a mental health program um, that provides mentorship and groups to help students rebound from difficult life experiences either on campus or, or outside of campus. Um, the small animal data station, uh, many of you remember it was like a hotel, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but it was designed for the tiny pygmy shrew. Now it's resulted in a patented JMU product that assists scientists around the world um, uh, as backyard naturalists. And then the JMU food pantry uh, that serves students um, has grown from providing basic necessities to incorporating financial literacy education that assists students in making sound decisions well on into their future. Uh, Duke Sat, many of you saw, it was on the front cover of the JMU website and the magazine as well. Um, you know, this was the second test of a high altitude balloon um, with a satellite, and uh, JMU prominently displayed. Uh, on that satellite. And then you've also probably read about the Africa medical supply chain um, project and those provisions that were supplied to Ethiopia and just the meaning that the faculty and students engaged in that derived. Um, and also the learning, the real hands-on learning about supply chain logistics management. So um, 
Now we're setting out to have a new day and a new batch of projects. Um, we have a high caliber group of faculty and staff that you'll be hearing from today. And we'll be hearing 10, specifically 10 pitches today. Um, we can't do it without you. Uh, remember, you've got your portfolios in front of you. Uh, they should provide you with a summary and some budget information. Um, we encourage you to participate today during um, the presentations and then again afterwards when we can meet individually with some of those faculty. But now I'm going to hand it off to the champion of the day, our Director of Corporate and Foundation Relations, Mr. John Meck. And again, thank you all for being here today and thank you for your willingness to be part of this experiment that we're in, all of us. Um, today we have folks, last year we were 100% virtual, which was a great experience for us and we learned a lot about how to manage that, how to present these presentations. Today we're excited to have people back in the room. There's no feel to this event like the feeling of having our supporters here to experience this live and in person. But bear with us a little because we have to give our folks who are online an experience as well so that everyone knows the way this is going to work today. The folks will do their presentations. The folks in the room, it's easy for you to ask questions. Our folks on Zoom, it's easy for you to ask questions of the presenters as well. We will make the chat available. You can enter your question in the chat. We have folks in the room here that will send that to me and I will represent our Zoom folks in the room. So I will ask your question for you if we get one in the chat that you want asked. So feel free to enter those in the chat. Also know that our presenters, our or investor judges who are here today have the opportunity at the end of the day to spend some time at a reception and ask other questions that they don't get to ask during the presentations. All of you all will get another crack at these folks when the day is over. Our folks on Zoom, what we're gonna to do to manage that so you all know is when we go to break, we're gonna open up breakout rooms. So if you are on Zoom, you'll get instructions how to go to the breakout room and you'll be able to meet with the presenters when we're at break so that you can ask your questions then. So you, if you're on Zoom today, you will get the opportunity like everyone else to ask those follow-up questions so if you're on Zoom and you enter something in the chat and for some reason I don't get to it or I miss it, you will still have your chance to ask that question of the presenters in the breakout rooms during the break. So those instructions will be in the chat for you. And again, we'll just follow through the itinerary today. Are there questions from the folks in the room? Do you all have any questions about how the day is going to go or things that you want to know before we start? With no further ado, then, let me get Mr. Wayne to you, and we'll get this thing kicked off. Thank you. All right. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. good morning. I'm here to talk to you about expanding the learning laboratory on the East Campus, which is the hillside that's not too far away from where we're sitting on, on this side of the, of the university. It was a project that was started back in uh, 2009 when President Rose uh, gave a talk, at least the part that I know about, was he gave a talk that wanted to integrate more environmentally friendly activities on campus, and they hired an outside consultant. And we started what became a meadow on the East Campus hillside. This is the meadow in 2013. We're clearing out some of the invasives that had gone into it in this particular activity. But you can see that one of the things that happened was we got something that looks a little bit different than grass. And this has enabled our students to take advantage of that particular area for a lot of educational opportunities that we would otherwise have to go off campus to get. We started, of course, as a university, 
1908, but this is a picture from the 1940s with, with the university down at the bottom. And the East Campus Hillside would actually be right in this area here. And you can see that this was pasture land and hay land. This is where we are right now, would be up in this area. The, uh, down in this area would be UREC, places like that. And we, of course, have I-81 in between. So there's quite a lot that's happened since 1940. Um, but one of the things that has happened is we built our building. And then we started to think about how we could better use the landscaping, especially the grass on the east side of the campus. So the first thing that we did was put in the meadow, which though the initiative started in 2009, the actual installation began in 2011. It was a few years uh, after that that the perennials started to dominate. The picture that's on the, on the right there, it's just the cover crops that came in first. We're gonna go through this same process soon, we hope. After 2013, classrooms started going out and using the hillside for a variety of different things. I sat in geography with the primary ones, but there are other courses that use the hillside now. In uh, 2018, partly as a result of Madison Trust, the, uh, we added a raised bed garden in the, in, the, in the area. I'll explain why it's a raised bed in just a minute. Um, and then added pollinator beds in 2019. Didn't get very far with that because COVID hit then not too long after that uh, and slowed us down a bit. But even with that, in, 2020, in 2021, we added a food forest. So we've done a lot of expansion in the area. And also, um, right now, if you go look, there's flags on the hillside where they've taken out a little bit of the meadow and they're gonna add a 300 kilowatt solar panel array on the hillside. This is the area where it's all happening. The original meadow is up here. There's four units of it. The original solar panels are up along the uh, carrier drive just before it goes across I-81. Uh, and we added the garden in 2018. This little line here, which I didn't really know showed up in a Google uh, Earth image, but it did, is actually the cable that supplies a lot of the East Campus's uh, connections to the internet, among other things. And so we couldn't dig there, and that's why we had to put raised bed gardens down at the bottom. Just above there, we're gonna put in, they are there now actually, some pollinator beds, but we need to improve them and expand them. Started that in 2019. The food forest went in this little section here uh, just this past fall. And we added some beehives in 2019. And they are, one hive anyway, is active right now. And we're working on improving that. And then the main focus of, of then the expanded solar, sorry, is going up there at the top. And the main focus of today's effort is the proposed meadow, which we want to put in this year. Part of the reason for the proposed meadow is to take the losses that we're getting from the, the expanded solar panels and, and put it in there. But the solar panels are not a complete loss because facilities management is going to put in a short grass prairie type uh, plantings underneath it. So it will still have a lot of species that can be used by pollinators but it'll be under the solar panels or between the solar panels. So this is the area looking at it again. The proposed uh, meadow expansion is gonna go right in this triangle area back here. The food forest is actually now located right in this area. And these students and faculty are working on the uh, pollinator beds. This picture was taken in the uh, spring of 2019. This is the raised bed garden as it was in 2018. Uh, we've actually got six of these beds now. There's just two in this particular photograph. Um, this was in the fall, not too long after they were first set up. One of the things we're after in this entire thing, of course, is a place where students can go to learn. And some of the activities that we've been doing on the hillside, includes my colleagues in the, in the geography program, um, is go out and document what animals have moved in because we've got so many new different species of plants. And so they're documenting butterflies and, and other, other critters like that that have come in. And 
one of the more exciting things that happened in the last year is my colleague that has done this came up to me very excited, I think it was in September, because they just documented their 26th new species coming into the hillside meadow area. Um, and they keep expanding. That's just of the butterflies. Um, over the course of the last seven years, when we've been using this, we've also been documenting exactly how it's been used. And the uh, <clears throat> Institute for Stewardship of the Natural World has actually uh, coordinated all the data from, from the use of it. And we're close to publishing a paper on that with uh, myself and s seven other colleagues. The lead author is actually in the Institute. And we've seen Three th over 3,000 students use directly using the hillside for classrooms. This does not include people just casually visiting. This is actually out in labs, actively using the area. Um, Fundamental of Environmental Science, which is a class that I teach, uh, has a lab that goes every year on this, usually 40 to 50 students that, that test soils and things like that. The uh, biogeography courses use this for both plant and animal labs uh, for their work, and the butterfly picture was, was from them. Um, we also have senior capstone projects in a lot, both geography and in, in ISAT program, and those capstone students use this area for some of their activities for research, doing lab work combined with um, field work right on campus. Uh, general education courses also include this, so if we added the general education numbers, the numbers would spike quite a bit, but every year general education classes go and just tour the area, and that often provides students for later classes that go use the uh, area for labs. And then life and environmental science for teachers also is using the living laboratory, and in some cases this has now connected with those teachers going out and using this kind of model in their own primary and secondary schools. So we're starting to see some add-ons to this project where people can go beyond and start using it elsewhere. And then other departments are getting more and more involved all the time. We don't have the documentation on this quite as much, but biology and geography or our geology are also using it and other places on campus as well. Um, people get excited about finding new species. This is called a brown belted bumblebee. Um, this was the best picture of a bumblebee that I could, I could come up with in this. Um, one of the more exciting findings was a rusty patch bumblebee, which is actually on the endangered species list. Unfortunately, the picture of it was taken with a cell phone and it doesn't have the quality to go up on, a, up on the screen. But that's exciting to see because the part of the reason for the extinction of a lot of bumblebees is the lack of diverse biotic community that we're trying to restore in this kind of setting. And we're also trying to restore the, the tree canopy too. And so one of my colleagues, uh, Michaela Schmidt-Harsh, who's working on this committee, uh, is shown here walking across the front, but we planted a number of fruit trees. There were 90 trees planted last um, fall with students. And one of the activities we're going to look at doing um, is planting pollinator species in the rows of the trees. So they'll be the understory in the tree crop. We've also gotten really excellent cooperation from a lot of different people on campus, among students and, and staff, as well as faculty. Um, and that has really helped. In this particular picture, you're actually seeing students from four different colleges that came out to volunteer on the, on the day we planted the fruit trees, as well as a couple of people from facilities management. So, our present need is to look specifically at where we would like to expand the meadow area because we're losing a little bit and we want to expand facilities that's provided us this, this area, but we don't have the funding available for it. So one of our goals is to install the new meadow area with a set of species that we have uh, identified that are more appropriate. In some cases, the species that we had in the first round of meadow planting in the successional process has led to a lot of grasses. But grasses aren't good at attracting pollinators. So what we're trying to do is then pick a new set of species that will lead to a more diverse uh, flowering uh, set of plants that will last the entire season. 
We're also trying to reconstitute the pollinator beds so that, that uh, people can have access to places where these species are identified. Instead of just in a wild meadow, it's in a place where they actually will have labeled plants in a raised bed that the students will then know how to identify them in other locations. And in the same time, we want to provide access to those for students who are um, disabled and get that straightened out. So we'll add some pathways from the existing sidewalks that they'll access from below the meadow area, or not above, because you have to go down stairs that way, but from below you can access it, and then pathways that go off the existing sidewalks over to these, these spots so they can, they can uh, participate as well. We'll need a few additional tools for that, for about, about $500, probably some electric uh, string trimmers and hedge trimmers and those kinds of things that will help us with the process. And then a little bit of work to get the beehives reconstituted. One of the things that happened with them is the COVID outbreak uh, sort of eliminated the transition between the, the beekeeping com committee of the students. It was a bee-involved uh, student club, and they couldn't transition because of, because of COVID. So we are reconstituting it. There's about six students involved already. They're getting the club up and running, but they need a little bit of money to get it kick-started and get the second hive back in shape. And so we put that in as well. At that, I will stop and, and ask for questions, and uh, thank you for your, your attention and time. Yes, sir. Thank you for your presentation. I mean, part of the need for this project is uh, come as a result of a third of the meadow be, being displaced with the solar panels. So if you look at all the planning that's gone on and the work with various parts of the campus, has that included work with long-range planning to ensure that there won't be further encroachment, necessary encroachment by the solar panels, but for the project and, and things you're putting in, I'm encouraged you're putting in trees uh, mm -hmm. because those are things that are, are a little more difficult to move. Yeah. Uh, but and, and I'm not suggesting anything <coughs> negative about this, but just to what extent have you looked at long-range planning where there may be also other <coughs> needs for that same space to ensure that whatever improvements you make here will be long will we'll continue to in, in the, into the future. Yeah, most of that is being done through the uh, Institute for Stewardship of the Natural World, and they have coordinated with uh, facilities management on a lot of the planning activities with this. Sometimes things surprise us. Sure. That's just the nature of, of how things work. But right now, I think the spirit of cooperation between facilities and long-term planning at the at the unit president's office and then uh, out through the provost office is, is a bit better. And, and we're, we're thinking about that. But right now, they're pretty committed to having this work because they've seen that student involvement is really what drives this, this particular program. And if you see this as a lab, not just as a, a, a lawn, it starts to look a lot better for the long term for that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for the presentation. Um, what role, specific roles, do you envision the students playing in the project, and how many students would you expect to be involved? Uh, well, just like the, the the fruit tree planting that you saw, we had we had about sixty come out. At least that was on the list. Um, they weren't there the entire time. Sometimes they have classes and other things, so you get some interchange. But we try to involve students at every stage in this particular project. So. Um, whenever there's a building activity that goes on, like constructing the raised beds or um, some uh, invasive species removal, there's a class that actually every fall goes out and, and they go out and study the invasive species and then remove some of them so that we can, we can keep uh, those kinds of things out of the meadow. Um, every activity that we do, we are trying to consider how we can involve students in the process. And so that enables us to expand the nature of the labs that we've got. And so we just simply incorporate that into the, into the process. And so the whole goal of this is to make sure we maximize student involvement. I would like to see it double in the next three years if we can. And I think this will help with that process. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, thank you again. Um, pollinators are obviously critical to our mm -hmm. food supply. And, and um, you said you're learning lessons about the right plants to, mm -hmm. that are more sustainable, and you have a paper coming out. Are you, are you developing best practices for establishing environment for pollinators? 
and sharing that across or is that something coming down the road it's it's both and in, in a lot of ways we have been learning a lot and as we learn it gets incorporated into the teaching materials and so that's coming but we're also um, looking to have students do some uh, experiments on what really are best practices because a lot of this is relatively new and every planting system that you have has to depend on the interaction between the the soil ecology and the surrounding natural ecology that we that we've got and so through time we're actually seeing changes in part because the landscapes improving and so it allows us to plant other species that not might not have been uh, as appropriate at the beginning so long, kind of a long answer but but the short answer is yeah we want to maximize this effectiveness. And so we're trying to uh, basically catalog or, or write down every observation that we make so that we can make the next round better through time. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Yes, sir. How are you going to coordinate with the facilities the department? Because well, at some point, they, if they fertilize or they do other things and it gets over into your meadow, it, it affects the, the studies and so forth. Yeah, it, it, what do you do to coordinate? It does. What's and that, their well, delineation it, of work? Yeah, that's a, that's a real good question. And we had, we had had some difficulties through time, um, in part because sometimes you have to train the people that mow the lawn so they don't creep into the meadow area. And so that, we've, that's, that has happened. And, but we have really good connections with facilities. And the key thing to that whole thing is, is uh, communications. Abe Kaufman is our main contact person in the facilities management. And he's out there with us when we're doing stuff, along with a couple of other people on his team. And then they take over the education of, of that uh, on their side. Our lab coordinator in the uh, environment team in the ISAT is going to have some of his time, thanks to the dean, among other people, uh, devoted to maintaining the living laboratory. So he will coordinate with, with Abe and the facilities people to make sure things are, are done, done correctly. But we've had to think about that because if you don't have good communication, it won't work. We've also been working with the director of facilities management and to ensure that, that she's committed. And she's very much so. In fact, she's now moved up the chain. She's the interim vice president for administration and finance. And she was extremely supportive about both the food forest and this new project. So it, it feels like those lines of communication are strong right now. Oh, yeah. Kawana Moore, who's, who's the person, is actually um, one of the first people who, who learned about just putting in the first meadow. And so she's been involved with it from the very beginning. And so we, we feel like the lines of communication are, are excellent at the moment. Yeah. It's, and thank you for the presentation. Point. Uh, is there like a more of a end goal or vision of like how this will become and you know complete exhibition of everything that we can possibly put into this country and expand or is this something that is kind of like okay yeah we're getting involvement so we're just kind of expanding spending so I'm just curious like what's the kind of like your end vision of this I guess the complete project to be at um, in, in the longer term. Yeah, we, we talk about it among ourselves frequently and one of the goals of course is to have a really healthy ecosystem and so students can see what that looks like. And so we monitor changes through time to see how we're reaching that goal. Um, we're not there yet. These take, these take a long time and it takes a whole successional process and understanding of that ecology. But sometimes the process of meeting a goal is the educational goal that you want. And so we're trying to do, to reach a, a much healthier ecosystem, but certainly to teach our students as that happens. So this is the unfun part of my job. I have to be the time warden in this <laughs> So thank you, Wayne. You're welcome. Thank you. Wayne was re uh, referencing on the facilities management team is actually his title is energy conservation and sustainability manager for facilities management. So it's not like Wayne is talking to someone who doesn't have any 
interest or expertise in this type of work you know that facilities management has a commitment to this as well Tawana is really quite eager about this and, and as we sort of transform the East Campus to make more and more of the outside space laboratory space this is really exciting Makes sense. So we're going to move to our next presentation. This is Fire from Meredith Miller Wade and her team. Good morning. We are here to ask your support for the Fire program. My name is Jared Diener. I'm Director of Honors Advising and Global Initiatives. I'm Dana Henry, the Coordinator of Student Creative Activities and Research, and a faculty member in the Department of Health Sciences. And I'm Meredith Melbourne Wade, the Director of Fellowships and Awards. Fire stands for First Year Research Experience. We match first year and new transfer students with experienced faculty mentors to collaborate on a research project. Students are paid for their work. It's a job. And this is really important because it provides an opening to students who also have to work for a living. The FIRE program bridges the gap between financial need and the opportunity to do research. So when you think of research, maybe you think of something like this. This is the mad scientist, Doc Brown, from the movie Back to the Future. Well, we're not here to build a DeLorean. We're not here to disrupt the space-time continuum. We are here because undergraduate research, at its core, changes lives. It's transformative. Undergraduate research is about building relationships with faculty, encouraging intellectual inquiry, developing problem-solving skills, supporting curiosity, teaching project and time management, encouraging teamwork and collaboration, developing confidence and competence, and enhancing skills for the 21st century workplace. To illustrate the impact of undergraduate research, let's hear from a, a few current and former students who discuss their own experiences. Daquan Nichols is in his second year at JMU. He is on track to graduate a full year early. He's a double major in biology and independent scholars, and he's planning on attending medical school after graduation. He says, the place I call home is a land of little opportunity. Research offers me an escape. It gives me a greater sense of purpose and presents tangible measures for my own development. The relationship with my faculty mentor is amazing. The way he uplifts me as a scientist and a human being gives me the confidence to succeed in my future endeavors. Alexandra Wilson is a recent alum. She graduated in 2019, majoring in international affairs, and she is currently pursuing a law degree at Seton Hall University. Ali says this, as a first generation college student, completing research with a faculty mentor was more than writing a paper. It was learning how to use my voice. It validated that I belonged in higher education. Despite not being as familiar with college as my classmates, conducting research was evidence that I possessed the same skills as them. My faculty mentor taught me how to believe in my writing and more importantly, how to believe in myself. Stephen Davick is a non-traditional student. He transferred to JMU a couple of years ago after serving five years in the US Marine Corps. Stephen is a triple major in intelligence analysis, psychology, and anthropology. And he is also, we just found out last week, the 2022 recipient of the Honors Scholar of the Year Award from the Virginia Collegiate Honors Council. We're very proud of his accomplishments. Stephen says, JMU enabled me to conduct applied interdisciplinary research in ways that have significantly impacted me. Through financial support, access to journals and databases, faculty mentors, interdisciplinary labs, and external research opportunities, I have learned the critical skills of research and analysis. This positive experience at JMU has significantly shaped my plans to continue research at the graduate level. So our students tell us that undergraduate research is transformative, but why? We expect students to leave college with certain skills like critical thinking, collaboration, problem solving skills, but in the classroom, there isn't always an opportunity to practice these skills using real world applications. Undergraduate research offers that opportunity, and that's because it's considered a high impact practice or a HIP. 
And these hips allow JMU to fulfill its vision to be the national model for the engaged university. And the positive outcomes from undergraduate research transfer to employer skills. In fact, they're among the top four skills desired by employers. And 81% of employers said that they'd be more likely to hire a student with an undergraduate research experience. At JMU, most research experience opportunities are offered within the academic departments, which is great, but it creates accessibility issues for some students. Some departments have more funding, some departments have lower teaching loads, um, other departments are unable to offer paid opportunities to the students. And because of this, not all students have the opportunity to participate in undergraduate research. In particular, we know that first generation and transfer students are much less likely to have these opportunities. They're not as able to develop relationships with faculty. They may not know that these opportunities exist. And if the opportunities are unpaid, they can't afford to volunteer their time to have these research experiences outside of the classroom. And that was certainly the case for me. Uh, when I was dropped off at college by my dad, he gave me $5 for lunch, you know, back when you could actually get lunch for $5. And uh, I had to work to pay for myself to go to school. One semester, a professor announced that he was hiring a student. And I honestly didn't hear the rest of what he said. I just applied for the job because I needed the money. It turned out to be a research experience. And it changed the course of my life. Because here I am standing in front of you now as a researcher and a professor, helping other students like me have access to opportunities that can change their lives. Students across JMU's campus face similar barriers. And that's why we are here today asking for your help. Because centralized, campus-wide programming can overcome a lot of these barriers, we are proposing the FIRE program. We are here to ask for as much money as possible, $25,000 or more, um, for this program. For each $1,700 we raise, we can create another faculty-student research pair. Through this programming, Faculty will work in learning communities to augment their mentorship skills. Students will conduct guided research and they will conduct regular evaluations. So we have data regarding the effectiveness of the program. This year, we were very lucky to inherit some leftover funds, mainly from programs due to COVID-19 that couldn't reach their capacity. We use those funds to create a short-term pilot program. As you can see from the titles that are popping up on the screen, there's a wide array of projects this year, from financial statements and data analytics to air quality assessment in rural Appalachia. What the screen won't show you, however, is the overwhelming response we received. This was a brand new program. We had an unbelievably short application window. And still 38 faculty asked to be paired more than 100 students applied, more than we could fund. Clearly, there's a demand for this kind of programming at JMU. We need your help for a second iteration of this program, a full semester program. Together, we can change lives at JMU. We can start to meet the demand for this type of programming. We can recruit and retain high achieving students at JMU, and we can help the next generation of Dukes have a stronger connection to their alma mater so that one day they can become alumni donors or be sitting in your chairs. As we move forward with this program, we're very focused on sustainability. How can we keep this moving forward? We're looking for ways to embed research opportunities in current curriculum. We're looking to make partnerships with colleges to work on external grants. And we're looking for ways to partner with local businesses to make the experience even more impactful. As JMU moves into R2 status, and we're recognized for our graduate programming and for our innovation and research, we can't lose sight of our undergrads. There are future business leaders, physicians, analysts, and the FIRE program is one of the ways we can effectively mentor and support these students. Like Dana, I too was a first gen student whose life was changed through research and mentorship. All three of us have dedicated our careers to helping students advance. 
We have the skills and the dedication to make this program work, and we're asking you to join us. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> uh, thank you for the great presentation and where you're headed with the, the project. With what you present is clear, you're going to have to continue to have a lot more faculty engaged. How are you, what do you propose to make it worthwhile for faculty to be a part of it and how will you mentor them along the way to, to be a part of this program? So one of my areas of expertise is faculty professional development. I worked for our Center for Faculty Innovation for four years. And so part of this program offers professional development opportunities for faculty, which will run through a professional learning community. So faculty will learn the special skills that are necessary to mentor first year students because they come with unique skills. Most students have research opportunities later in their time here when they're already well established. And so it takes special skills to help uh, first generation students, transfer students, and students who are new to JMU. How do students hear about the program? Like how do you reach out to students to make them aware that this is available? So we have partnerships with our first year advising and transfer advising offices. They reached out to all the first year and transfer advisors. So JMU has a unique program where you have a different advisor to help you transition from college or from your community college to JMU. So we partnered with them. They're the ones that advertised it. In addition, we reached out to our research and scholarship liaisons and they advertised it through the departments as well. And that's why we received over 100 applications from students. And when we say short window, they had one week from the time we announced the program to apply, and over 100 students did. So we know that more students would be interested, but because of the short timeline, they couldn't apply. Just to follow up, we, we were worried that we yes. didn't get enough applicants <laughs> for the money that we had, and that yeah. was clearly not the case. So yeah. um, it, it, our, our communication was effective this year. Yeah. From what you described, it sounds like you will have way more student demand than you can currently meet. How are professors going to go about screening, vetting, interviewing to make sure they get the right students in the right projects? I will say that we did that this year. Um, given the really short time frame, we had an application where the faculty submitted first with a project description. It was published. And then students could go in and pick their top three choices. And then we looked at student responses, student experiences, what they hoped to gain, what the faculty member hoped to impart. And we made those matches. One of the things we're learning is that we might not do that moving forward with more time. <laughs> um, that we could give faculty a list of students with specific skills listed, what they hoped to gain, and that faculty could help us making, in making that decision. Thank you. We're learning a lot. <laughs> a great, great effort, great presentation, but really impactful uh, project. Um, how do you... Can, He's just talking about the student selection piece. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the other side of the yeah. supply. Mm -hmm. how, are we, um, how are we prioritizing the research projects? Because I would assume you have more projects than you can fund. Yes. <laughs> so what's that prioritization process like? So a we looked at a couple of things this semester. We wanted to represent the diversity of disciplines across JMU. So we made sure to select uh, faculty from all the different colleges. The other thing we looked at was their mentorship plans. So we asked the faculty in their application to describe how they would mentor the students differently from the students that enter their labs later in their time. And so we looked to see, did they have specific mentorship plans that paid attention to the fact that these students were gonna come in without as many courses or as much preparation and experience? And so between that combination, we were able to narrow it down, but it was really disappointing to not be able to fund. All of the projects were worthy of funding all of the students were worthy of having these opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we did is we then shared the interested students information back to the departments and colleges to say, hey, we have these students who raised their hand and said they're interested. So we wanted to make sure to follow through with those students and give them those opportunities by sharing their information with their permission back to their departments so that hopefully the departments might match our funding and then provide additional opportunities for those students who said they wanted to participate. Uh, pay for all the students, so it kind of keeps it equal for all the students? It's $1,200 for the semester. Uh, we did $1,000 for the reduced program this year. You mentioned that you, you, you attempt to have diversity across the curriculum. 
uh, most of the examples, and clearly most people think of research, they think of the sciences and social sciences, but what, I, uh, what about those that are in creative expression? What kinds of opportunities are there there? We have two recipients this year from the uh, CDPA, uh, Visual and Performing Arts. And I think from the CDPA and the College of Education, we noticed we had the smallest number of applicants overall. And so those are areas where we want to recruit further in the future. If we have a second iteration of this program, of course, it's going to be open to, to all colleges, but we want to make sure that they understand that those opportunities are also there for them. Thank you. I have a PhD in English, so I'm here for the humanities. <laughs> <laughs> So do you have a timeline oh, sorry, Timeline for the number of student matches this year versus next year? And how, what's your ultimate kind of goal? Our goal for next year is to advertise in the fall, um, solicit application materials in the fall, and make matches before the end of the fall semester so that students can return in the spring ready to focus a full semester on research. This semester, we had to do a lot of that work together um, over the holiday break. And then a lot of those students were starting their research March 1. You, you may have addressed it. But thank you for the presentation. It seems yeah. like a terrific uh, thing to support. But is this a stopgap? Are you looking for s sustainability? You, mm -hmm. you can go to corporations or other institutions and show that you have success and you'll get grants. The sustainability, if you have 100 applicants and mm -hmm. 14 openings. <laughs> If you do a great job, then that's your thought. This is this is the catalyst. Yeah. And this then yes. You can go to sustainability. Exactly. This is the seed funding, so that we can show the demand and the success. So we're collecting data on the faculty-student pairs regarding their mentorship and how their skills have developed. We can use that data to partner with colleges. So a lot of the grant funding that's available for these types of programs are typically tied to disciplines through things like NSF, NEH, as well as through foundations and like corporate foundations. And so we would partner with faculty or department heads in those departments using the data that we have to apply for longer programs um, that would exist to help train the students in those disciplines. And then the corporate partnerships are really in line with the work that RNS is doing right now. So Research and Scholarship, which is the office that we work in, they're really working hard to expand and develop our corporate relationships. And uh, one great model of this is um, in some colleges, alumni from a particular college like the College of Business might invest in a research opportunity and the students will collect data that support the businesses functioning to help students see that um, you will use data and analysis tools when you work in business. Some business students in particular are rather have high paid internships working at a, co a corporation during the summer instead of doing research. But these programs show them that you need to know how to do research to be successful in your career. Then the corporations that donate that money have a pool of students with research experience that they can draw from for internships in a subsequent semester or hire directly out. So those are the kind of models that we're using to develop corporate relationships and apply for grants. Thank you. And just really quick, is that, is that relationship, that bridge to internship, is that theoretical or is that in practice? So, Right now at JMU, we probably have a few that we're not familiar with. This is an existing program at another institution that I'm familiar with. And so it's a win-win situation for them to financially support undergraduate research, get data for their business, and then basically they're pre-interviewing these students, right, for an internship later. In particular, it really helps a lot of students who get access to internships get access because of their GPA. And so that limits who had, we miss a lot of really wonderful students who maybe struggle with classwork, but who have amazing innovative ideas. And so that's one of the opportunities, ways that we can help students who maybe don't have the strongest GPA show their value to, to companies. Yeah. All right, thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. So for those in the room, we're going to take a break until 11.10. For folks on Zoom, you should be getting instructions on how to enter the breakout room so that you can ask your questions of the presenters that you didn't get a chance to ask. So with that, thank you all. And if we could be back at 11.10 so we can promptly start again at 11.15. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is going to be
I think the food is different. The, everything is so different. And with traffic and driving, you know, just, you know it's, I, I make it analogous to a thousand times worse than me driving to the Black Spirit in Virginia. Yeah. It's the same thing. You're like, ah, don't have to worry about the tech techs. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, he gave, he gave my husband this really metal tech tech. It's so cute, you know, but it's just. Yeah, for him, he loves this. I mean, you know, I'm not 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 I'm
It's a big company. Yeah. In the news every day. Good and bad. Unfortunately. Previous Madison Trust participants may have seen in the past, but with that, I don't want to steal a thunder. Dr. Holland, feel free. Begin. Thank you, John, and thank you for having me this morning. Uh, my name is Steve I'm the Associate Vice Provost for Research and Innovation here at JMU, and I've been a part of this project uh, for several years, about four years now. And I'm excited to uh, talk to you today about the Chronic Cough Suppression Project, which showcases the translation of JMU research into application with medical well-being impacts. And to begin, I want to invite you to entertain a brief fictional story about Nancy. Nancy is a 36-year-old wife, mother, and a middle school teacher. In the fall of 2018, Nancy awoke with a cough and a stuffy nose. Not a big deal, just a common cold. And of course, she was right. Over the next couple of days, you know, she, had, she uh, got a sore throat uh, and uh, the, all of the symptoms of a common respiratory uh, virus developed. Um, but within a week, most of the symptoms have had subsided and she was feeling much better. But the cough, the cough lingered. In about four weeks, Nancy was becoming frustrated with this lingering dry cough. Some nights she would lose sleep and wake exhausted. The episodes seemed to come on at the worst times, when she was helping students or when she was in an important faculty meeting. This would often cause disruption and embarrassment. With the cough persisting for over, um, over uh, six weeks, uh, Nancy sought medical advice. She was becoming worried. What if this is something more than just a cough? Following months of medical evaluations, tests and examinations and worrying over the potential of uh, results, thankfully the results ruled out any serious conditions. But with all medical causes ruled out, Nancy was diagnosed with what is known as a chronic cough with no underlying cause and she was directed to manage those symptoms uh, as necessary by using cough suppressants and lozenges. Nasal surgery was suggested as one potential but not guaranteed way to alleviate her symptoms. And although the cough never completely subsided, the episodes were less frequent during the summer months. But the next fall, they started to resume again, again at the most inconvenient times and often associated with stressful situations. Nancy disliked taking cough medicines because they made her feel groggy and disoriented. Chewing gum and lozenges would help manage the symptoms and occurrences sometimes, but would not completely prevent them. These nagging symptoms persisted in waves for several years without specific triggers being identified. Was it allergies? Was it the weather? Stress? A combination of these things? And of course, as you can imagine, during the uh, pandemic, um, this caused uh, a lot of stress and concern. Am I more susceptible? Will others think that I have this virus? What happens if I cough during a meeting? And probably many of you in the room right now are conscious of your, uh, <laughs> of am I going to cough? And what's that going to mean? Nancy's story may seem familiar to many of you in the room. Uh, it's not an uncommon scenario. Clinical studies estimate that over one third of adults will experience a chronic, a chronic cough, which is defined as a cough that persists for more than eight weeks with no underlying medical causes, within their lifetime. Some will resolve on their own and others will persist for many years with the airway sensitivity that triggers the cough being exacerbated by stress and environmental condi conditions. This persistent cough can impact the quality of life for the patient and cost billions of dollars annually in the healthcare industry for diagnosis and treatment. Current solutions include prescription medication, over-the-counter medicine, and speech therapy. Prescriptive med medicines can cause cognitive side effects and then that they can also be addictive. So they're infrequently used and avoided except for the most extreme cases. And studies have shown that over-the-counter medicines uh, are largely ineffective because they just mask the symptoms and they don't actually treat the underlying cause. Speech and behavioral therapy has demonstrated efficacy, but they require numerous office visits over many months or years. Now, retired um, 
faculty member uh, in the Communication Sciences and Disorders program, Dr. Christy Ludlow, and uh, current faculty member, Dr. Aaron Camerunis. They study the interactions between the brain and the control reflexes that are related to speech and swallowing. And while investigating swallowing reflex, reflexes in some of their patients, they noted that uh, the application of low frequency vibrations to the exterior of the neck reduced the sensitivities that cause coughing. Dr. Ludlow filed a intellectual property disclosure with the university and we are currently actively pursuing a patent for this non-invasive chronic cough therapy concept. Based on scientific studies, both here at JMU and elsewhere, vibration application, think about your phone's uh, vibration setting, applied to this area of the neck overloads the, uh, the sensory receptors in the, in the larynx and over several weeks desensitizes the neurons that cause this sensitivity and urge to cough. Such treatment is non-invasive and does not require multiple office visits provided that a wearable therapy device can be devised. With Madison Trust funding from uh, 2018, two engineering students collaborated with Dr. Camerunis and Dr. Ludlow to develop a proof of principle concept, which is seen here. And actually, if anyone wants to look uh, at the physical prototype, I have it here as well. And it's intended to uh, be situated uh, on the neck right here. Um, this principle, proof of principle prototype, as you can see, uh, was, was meant to demonstrate the efficacy of the vibration application, but it certainly wasn't designed to be a product. Um, the prototype is connected to computers, uh, to data acquisition and uh, power via those wires there, and certainly is not suitable for an at-home wearable uh, therapy. Um, in clinical tests with the prototype, uh, it was demonstrated that the applied vibrations were comfortable, they were soothing, and did not adversely impact the patient. However, obviously, patients were concerned about the size and the appearance of the device, as well as the tethered nature of it. Last year, within the Office of Research and Scholarship, the Technology Innovation Office sought feedback uh, on advancing and licensing this technology and other technologies at JMU. Significant interest was expressed in this therapy, but similar feedback was provided, highlighting that although the concept had been demonstrated, the vision for it as a product uh, and an at-home therapy device was not readily apparent to investors, licensees, or patients. This Madison Trust um, project proposes the advancement of the design of this technology from its proof of principle state towards a prototype production ready design that de-risks and clearly demonstrates it in a marketable form. A wearable device that is small and comfortable and attractive and battery powered. A device that be, can, can be controlled and monitored wirelessly with a simple user interface and that allows for data sharing uh, and therapy progress to be monitored while affording privacy. To achieve this, Product design and engineering expertise from across the university will be leveraged to develop a detailed design that is required to um, re realize this uh, cough suppression therapy in a licensable and marketable form. Details such as battery power, miniaturization, and uh, digital signal processors, wireless communication, user interface design, and design for manufacturability need to be considered. The design will be documented and the effort will culminate in manufacturing and assembly documents appropriate uh, to produce the device. So this funding request is uh, moving forward to compensate uh, the faculty experts and to allow them to work with students and compensate those students for the time invested in advancing this product design. Engineering and industrial design students will be engaged throughout the process, providing a mentored professional experience in product design and manufacturing for those students. And with a fully funded project, we would like to produce approximately 10 prototype units that uh, will allow for future studies to be conducted and demonstrations of the therapy. Um, the availability of these detailed designs and prototypes will clearly uh, demonstrate the product vision and communicate that to uh, potential licensees. 
and will afford the student researchers uh, and as well as the faculty researchers opportunities to pursue additional grant funding such as small business innovative research programs and with the National Institutes for Health and private partnerships. Throughout and beyond this one year detailed design office, uh, des detailed design effort, the Office of Research and Scholarship will remain committed to advancing the intellectual property protections and pursuing technology licensing partnerships for the future. So within uh, two years, we hope to have the, the product uh, uh, prototypes completed and be pursuing licensing opportunities. And I want to point out that this is a continuation. Uh, we did get to the uh, proof of principle concept based on some initial funding from 2018. Um, with an estimated uh, 27 plus million individuals diagnosed with chronic cough, and by the way, that is an underestimate. Uh, we, we do know that there's, uh, we do think that there is greater prevalence than is actually diagnosed in the population. And approximately 3 million individuals uh, being diagnosed with this per year. This proposed therapy has significant impacts to the quality of life and significant market potential impacts, uh, even with a modest capture of, of, of a few million individuals. I should also point out that um, Dr. Ludlow, uh, who is now actively seeing patients again, has noted an increase in the prevalence due to the recent pandemic um, and, and some of the consequences of COVID-19. So your investment will make this impact possible by supporting a powerful collaboration between the inventors, engineers, designers, students, clinicians, and our technology licensing experts. Thank you for your help in advancing JMU's first medical therapy device invention to market realization, and for supporting all of the excellent ideas that are emerging from JMU researchers. I'd be happy to uh, address any questions about the team or the project at this time. Thank you. Just a question about the device. Is it, is it a constant stimulation and does the stimulation alter the voice in any way? Um, I, there are multiple forms that the uh, stimulation could take. Uh, what it is envisioned as is a periodic stimulation and um, how the therapy has uh, sort of evolved is basically when there is an urge to cough that is emerging, basically the user would pull out their phone or turn it on somehow to then uh, stimulate that vibration application. And then once it subsides, the, that uh, application, uh, vibration is removed. So it should not alter the voice. There will be a little bit of alteration, but it's, it's, a, it's a fairly small vibration. Yes. Yes. Thank you for the presentation. <clears throat> um, in the news all the time, they talk about AFib, AFib mm -hmm. uh, atrial fibrillation, small electro electrical devices around the heart. And so what, what medical advice do you get? What input do you get? Because you're going to put a device, if we get a Fitbit on, we have to check with our cardiologist how right. it's going to affect us. So if someone's wearing a pacemaker or something else, so you, are you're getting feedback from somewhere for medical unintended consequences? Oh, unintended consequences. Yeah, and that's where we need to work with. Uh, so, so Christy Ludlow and, and Dr. Camerunis uh, are, are, are experts in that area. We would need to do some more uh, research after the device is designed to understand how those interactions may uh, potentially interact and impact in your you're exactly correct. We, we have thought about that, and we don't know exactly what the implementation to um, those may be. You can tell from the cough on one of your subjects. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. I actually have a Zoom room question for us. So Ryan LeKay would like to know, how do you envision partnering with healthcare providers? That is a great question. Uh, my background is in engineering, uh, so I, I'll be honest, I am uh, not the expert in that, and we hope to uh, bring in the expertise of, of um, uh, Dr. Camerunis on that. She works regularly, interacts regularly with uh, Centera and partners at uh, UVA Medical, um, but uh, that we do need some feedback in, in that uh, space. Uh, some of the licensing uh, that has been explored previously did involve uh, medical professionals. Yes, sir. I mean, it just makes you think about it, other applications beyond perfecting this one. I mean, if you look at that area and whether you're trying to improve for one's, one's voice quality or uh, dealing with other issues they may have, or, are there other 
uh, areas of research and, and application that come into play here that you might find other interest? Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, actually, out in the hallway before this, we were talking with an, another individual who uh, for, for tinnitus, so for ringing of the ears, a similar therapy has been proposed that kind of masks and, and retrains the, uh, uh, the sensory receptors. Um, also, uh, I should point out that uh, the swallowing uh, rehabilitation for patients who have uh, either suffered a stroke or other medical condition. Um, that was actually the genesis of this discovery. So they are applying uh, sort of a, a massage technique to stimulate uh, swallowing uh, for patients who have challenges with uh, um, tongue motor um, control. Yeah, it could be folks that have uh, acid reflux or mm -hmm. Barrett's disease. I mean, there are all kinds of things you could think about that might help alleviate some of those challenges in that same location. I love the generation of ideas of where else, where this, where else this could be applied. Great, great, great presentation and love the, the concept here. Um, <clears throat> can you just say a little bit more about uh, protecting the IP? And then the second question I have for you is around the software element of this. Mm -hmm. Scope can get pretty broad pretty quickly. Correct. Um, can, is, are there plans beyond just activation through software? Are there plans for, let's say, customer experience, data, analysis of data? Can you talk a little bit about what the scope is for this software development? Sure, and, and, and thank you for pointing out the scope uh, and, and size of the request versus the, the scope of the project. Uh, I think a, in a full product vision, we would rely on licensees uh, to, to fully realize the extent of the, the software capabilities. I think uh, this does provide an enormous opportunity for data collection and transmission uh, back to uh, clinicians uh, to help, and the patient as well, to help them understand their condition. Uh, but that's probably beyond the scope of what this project, uh, what this ask is for. Um, really, uh, we, we have and would like, to, uh, are planning to engage uh, industrial design experts and uh, some uh, faculty who have expertise in wearable technologies to consider the user interface and really uh, intentionally design how the customer, how the patient would interact with the device. But I, I think there are still a lot of other avenues that we will not be able to explore on sort of that data management, uh, processing, and, and um, interpretation side. Are there any other uh, devices like this in the market or anything similar that, that you all that have maybe failed or, or didn't work or anything that you've kind of uh, researched? So we have done a, a pretty extensive search and that's what we brought actually some of the uh, license ex licensing experts in uh, last year to take a look at and we did, did not find any such product on the market. There are, are a, a number of labs uh, that are studying this phenomenon but nothing that is envisioning it as a wearable product. Uh, they're, uh, again, medical where you go to the clinic and actually get a procedure or a regular treatment. Um, those have existed, but there is not a lot of um, uh, evidence out there about uh, treatment options uh, for chronic cough. And I should note that, um, I, I apologize, I didn't address the question about uh, um, the intellectual property. Um, a, in, it, it, we have filed and the uh, in, initial provisional uh, was accepted and then we moved through a process of uh, filing the full patent. Um, we uh, encountered a difficult examiner who um, who could not separate the fact that uh, this was a um, was not an implantable device? So they kept going back to um, the uh, pacemaker type of technologies and saying, "Well, this is the same as that." Um, so what we have done is we went through uh, and revised the claims and have refiled. So we are reinitiating the refiling process that clearly delineates the um, the concept as a, a topical um, around the neck application specific for chronic cough. Anything else from the group? All right, thank you, Dr. Thank you, thank you so much. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
All right, we're now ready to welcome Dr. Donald Sindel and his group of students. Whenever you're ready, sir. Yeah, good morning. Thanks good morning. for uh, having us. Uh, I'm Dr. Jonathan Spindell. This is Karina Howard and Carter Elliott. And what we'd like to talk to you about today is a project that we're working on using video games to do a rehabilitation of people with dizziness and balance disorders. Now, you'll notice the backdrop on this slide is Starry Night, uh, the infamous uh, Vincent Van Gogh, of course. Um, the story, of course, goes with Vincent Van Gogh that he cut his ear off and sent it to his lover. But act in actuality, we believe that he suffered from something called Meniere's disease, which is episodic vertigo and roaring in his ear. And he was probably cut his ear off to try to get that sense of motion and that sense of roaring to go away. If you notice, a lot of his artwork includes swirls and uh, things that indicate an experience, a longstanding experience with vertigo. Now, my own involvement in the uh, program started with my uh, early career start working at NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, where I volunteered as a test subject on the zero gravity flights. And you'll actually see me floating around in the middle with a lot more hair and certainly darker hair. Um, so that gave me a real appreciation for, uh, for the, the value of the balance system and vertigo and so on. Now, when I left NASA in, um, in the late, in the mid 80s and went to University of Virginia to pursue my PhD program, I actually did that in hearing and balance, worked on implantable hearing devices, but I also cross-trained as a vestibular physiologist, where I set up and developed and ran the clinical lab in the University of Virginia Health Center that worked with people with that balance and dizziness disorders. So from that background, I had a longstanding interest in hearing imbalance and what we could do about it. So that brings us to our program itself. So the idea that we came up with, and this is something I've been working on for a long time, is the idea could we gamify vestibular rehabilitation therapy, vestibular exercises? Could we create game-based exercises that parallel the things that we would normally send home with the patient, make them more engaging, more interesting, and more likely that the patient would actually continue and finish the therapy that they needed to do? Um, but center to this is the fact that I wanted this effort to be student-centered design. 
And so we, this is part of an ISAT capstone process. So uh, Carter is here representing the 2022 team. So they started last year and developed and he'll be graduating this year. And Karina is here representing the 2023 team that started this year and will carry through next year. So with that said, let me turn this over to Karina to tell you a little bit about her experience. Okay, so I became very passionate about this project because back in 2019, my father struggled from an ischemic stroke. This affected the right side of his brain, which gave it a deficit to his balance as well as his speech. From one to two years, he went to extensive occupational and physical therapy. And my father is a dentist, so I believe one of these treatments or methods would be very good for him because it would be able, it would give him the ability to do it on his own time. Thank you, Karina. So with that said, what's the scope of the problem? Okay, where, where does this really come into play? Well, 30% of adults over the age of 40 have some sort of dizziness or balance disorder in, in uh, experience. 60 million people, roughly. That raises to 80% in people over the age of 65. It's the number one complaint of, of people going to the doctor over the age of 70. It's the number three complaint against uh, of all patients going to the doctor uh, after headache and lower back pain. Um, and in addition, 50% of soldiers coming back from, from war with injuries report dizziness as one of their post-injury symptoms, with an additional five to six suffering from dizziness post-deployment. Basically, one in three people will have problems with dizziness at some point in their lives. So one of the issues with dizziness as a symptom is it's a complex, dizziness imbalance is a complex system. So unlike vision, which is just your eyes, or hearing, which is just your ears, the balance system is actually an integrated sense. It puts together input from your inner ear or vestibular system, your visual system, uh, your proprioceptive system, as well as your um, central nervous system. And let me explain this a little bit. Um, when you were a kid and you used to spin around and get dizzy and felt like the whole world was moving, that was because you got the fluid of your inner ear, your vestibular system going. When you're in a car and somebody pulls out next to you and suddenly you felt like you went backwards, that's the visual component. When you're going up in an elevator and you get that sense of motion through your feet and knees that you're moving, even though you can't see any motion, that's that proprioceptive, the signals that come throughout your body. And then, of course, not that anybody in this room has ever done it, but if you've seen someone drink a little bit too much and stumble around dizzy and drunk, part of the reason is they've medicated their central nervous system. So anything that affects one or more of these things will give you a false sense of motion or a sense of being off balance. Well, with that said, 85% of the kinds of disorders that affect this relate to the inner ear. So let me talk just briefly, do a little bit of science explanation about the inner ear. So you guys have uh, all remember your high school biology with, your, with the ear, right? Sound comes into your ear, it vibrates the eardrum, chain of three bones, and then goes into a spiral fluid-filled structure known as the cochlea. Well, if we blow this one up here, you can see Adjacent to the cochlea is the vestibular system. That's the thing that looks sort of like a pretzel here. And it has two different components. One is the semicircular canals. You can see they're circular canals. So they allow you to sense rotational kinds of movements. And then there's the otolith organs that allow you to sense where you are with respect to gravity. You take it for granted when you wake up in the morning, you know which way is up. Well, that's part of the system that allows you to do that. So with this complicated system, what do we do once something goes wrong? This is actually a picture from the New River Gorge, Surprise Rapids, and that's actually my leg sticking vertically out of the water. <laughs> now, I feel, I feel a little bit vindicated because the guide went out behind me. So, so I was only the second person out of the boat because the whole back of the boat folded in. But what do we do once something goes wrong? Well, fortunately, we have something in our brain called the adaptive controller. So the fact is we're all on a downhill slope from the age of 20 on. Our inner ear is changing, our, our uh, proprioceptive system changes, our visual system changes. Hopefully our brain doesn't change for a while. Um, but all of that contributes to a change. But we have this ability to adapt and tune. And if you think about it, an Olympic gymnast is born with good balance, but she's not born a gold medalist. She actually tumbles every day, she trains herself, walks the balance beam every day, and in some ways you can think of it, she makes herself superhuman. Well, in the same way we can make use of the same adaptive controller 
to allow people that are having deficits to retune the system and retune it using something called vestibular rehabilitative therapy. So what is vestibular rehabilitation? Well, the current state is we send people home with a set of exercises. They're pretty straightforward. You know, turn your head left to right, up, down, side to side, sit down, stand up, turn around, and so on. Obviously, th these were developed um, in the 1940s to treat soldiers actually coming back from war. It's called the cawthorn Cooksey exercises. They're designed to, to promote that adaptive controller to compensate and desensitize. It's still widely used today, but it has problems because people go home and they start doing it and they, you know, they get bored, they get dizzier, it, they, they're not w willing to push far enough along to actually get the benefit from it. And so that brought in this idea of video game-based vestibular rehabilitative therapy. And so the project we've, we're working on is a phase one was first to develop and do some early stage testing, and that's what Carter will talk about in a minute. Uh, phase two is to enhance um, and look at other technologies like augmented reality and second level testing. And then finally, the goal would be to continue to refine and test this in clinical patients. So with that said, let me pass this over to Carter to talk about his experience in going through our phase one development. All right, cool. Thank you, Dr. Spindell. Good morning, everybody. My name is Carter Elliott, and I'm a senior integrated science and technology student here at JMU with an a concentration of applied data science and machine learning. But as much as I am a student, I am also, I mean, as much as I am a scholar, I am also a student. I'm a member of the Tenor Sax one section in the Marching World Dukes. You guys are familiar with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of the project itself, it helped me to learn a lot more and refine my skills in my concentration. So of course I did data science machine learning. I, I created an algorithm to basically help define and predict where new patients would begin their training or their therapy, you know, by using this website down here, uh, codenamed the ISET, which is the Individualized Suggestion Algorithm Tool. We'll go into that in a little bit if you guys want. But in addition to that, I also helped to basically integrate the system and develop the solution. I helped to plan the VR environment itself. I figured out how they're gonna, everything is going to work together because you can't have all these separate pieces, right? But in addition to that, I learned a lot of soft skills with pro uh, project management, you know, communication, your leadership, your general skills. All this together helped me to land a job in October, which is very early on, you know, considering many people are still, uh, still looking for their jobs now. So it helped me to boost my skills in a bunch of different areas, which is awesome. So in terms of the study itself, we had 22 people total. Um, and this study was split up into two different parts, each with three subparts. Okay, so the first part was a non VR exercise um, training area. So the first exercise we had people do was called eyes side to side. And then simply what that is, is we had an object here. And this is the object we used in the study. And basically, we'd have people look side to side in an arc motion by just using only their eyes and their peripheral vision, just like this. Basically, this works the horizontal plane of the vestibular system. So the horizontal uh, semicircular canal, which you can see here. Then we made that into a VR game by basically calling it follow a firefly in the VR system itself, which they would basically do the, same, do the same motion in the VR game. The second part was called bend over and sit up. So basically, this works the vertical semicircular canal here. And the way we did that is we had a person sit in a chair, and they just basically bend over, touch the object to the ground, and sit back up with their back against the chair and look at the object the whole time, stimulating the horizontal, I'm sorry, the vertical semicircular canal. And we made that into a VR game by basically putting a log simulator. So you pick, pick up a log and put it into a campfire. Um, and then the final one here in terms of uh, the non-VR exercise is we do a toss and catch. So basically the participant would have the object, they toss it in an arc motion and follow with their eyes, their head and their neck, stimulating both the horizontal and vertical semicircular canals, putting the two together. Um, in terms of a VR portion, what we did is we did what's called toss and catch a rock. Same motion, just in VR. Instead of doing a plushie, you do a virtual rock, which is pretty cool. So as you guys have probably seen by now, um, basically the entire theme of this is camping, outdoors. People, love, people go outside to relieve stress, to feel more relaxed. And that's what we tried to simulate in this game itself with a starry night, some nice piano music behind it, nice calming atmosphere to really engage and have the person come in, come in and really just enjoy their experience. And as you can see here, uh, each exercise had a sign post next to it so people can do this at home on their own, emphasizing that at home capability. So the follow firefly here, this is basically phase two of the study where they do the VR exercises. The follow the firefly follows, you know, it's pretty simple. Follow the firefly side to side, stimulating a horizontal semicircular canal. Then when it comes to picking and placing along with the vertical, you would reach over, you'd bend the log and uh, put the log in the fire, look over to the side, pick up another log and repeat that same motion. Basically 
working that vertical semicircular canal, getting that vestibular system working in a vertical direction. And with a toss and catch, basically you put the two together. You look up and down by watching the rock as it flies and go side to side by watching it fly side to side, as you can see here. Um, so in terms of the outcomes of the study, uh, people seem to really love this thing. So we had many, many, many comments loving, people love the atmosphere. They love the plushie, which is so strange, but they loved it. Um, they loved the music. They loved how engaging it was. They loved everything about it. But some of the ones that stuck out to me when I was looking at the data itself, um, somebody's mom just had surgery and she suffers from balance issues because of that. And she wants to basically, uh, he wants to basically have his mom try out the game and see if it actually will work. Uh, people love the design, as I said, um, love the audio and the visual. Um, the exercises translated VR very, very, very well. And the exercise was more entertaining than doing it in a clinician's office, which is huge. That's the main goal, to get people more engaged and to do this at home. So the fact that people were saying that already in a study between 18 and 22 year old college students, that opens up the door greatly to uh, the population outside of the university, which is great. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Dr. Spindell. He's gonna explain the final phases. You can keep the plushie. Oh, I will definitely keep the plushie. Okay, so again, the focus of this work is our phase two and phase three, right? Um, Carter, Carter and his team did a great job on our phase one. So phase two, enhancing the environment, trying to look at augmented reality as another option here and doing some additional testing. Um, and then finally, uh, phase three, where we're refining testing and uh, hopefully uh, getting into clinical subject pools. So the project budget that we propose is shown here. You can see there's a large chunk for student summer support as well as student conference travel. The American Balance Society meeting is, an, is going to be an invaluable opportunity to put this technology in front of uh, clinicians and researchers that focus all their energy and effort into um, balance work. So we want to get in front of them and get their feedback and, and get input. Uh, we'll also be refining it and looking at augment, uh, other kinds of augmented and virtual reality uh, equipment as well as supplies and materials to do our next level of testing and then some incidentals as well. Um, in summary, our proof of concept that Carter and his team had worked on demonstrated that this platform uh, has the potential to transform not just virtual uh, uh, vestibular rehab therapy but other types of physical therapy as well. Uh, moving forward, we want to work on enhancing the VR environment, polish it up, uh, develop new games, create multiple levels, um, explore devices that would allow for augmented as well as virtual reality, and then continue to refine all aspects of the system in preparation for testing in clinical subjects. Ultimately, though, our goal is to develop a stable and scalable platform for use with clinical users going forward. So with that said, that pretty much wraps up our presentation portion. We would absolutely love to answer questions. I'm quite sure there's not a single person in this room that hasn't had somebody in their life experience some sort of vertigo or dizziness experience. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. That was very interesting. Um, so two questions. One, ultimately, is this, do you envision it as a... VR kind of application that I load onto my Oculus or some other kind of platform? And two, have you looked at the extensibility or is it extensible to eye type of therapies, lazy eye, amblyopia? It seems like the same kind of interface. Yeah, absolutely. We have not looked into that. My area comes in from more of the dizziness and balance disorders, but certainly as we develop this as a tool, it opens itself up to anything that, that promotes eye movement, head movement, full body motion, any of those kinds of things uh, could, could come into play. And I'm sorry, and the platform itself, is it ultimately an app? Uh, yeah, Oculus so right based now VR? the app is an Oculus app. Okay. Now that has certain limitations as we've come to yes. find. You can only load up certain size kinds of things and the precision of the environment. So that's one of the technology pieces is we'd like to look at other technologies to see if we can make a deeper and more enriched environment. Also, this idea of using augmented reality, because the problem with completely substituting the environment for the real environment is now that, that, re that, that virtual environment has to be much more rich. If you can do it tied into uh, to a, uh, to an environment that, like this that already exists and just add components to it, the, 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 the amount of, um, of graphical writing is certain, certainly simplified 
and um, and you can uh, you can get more directly at the kinds of activities that you're trying to get at to, if that helps. Thank you. Sure. Yes, sir. I was fascinated by the numbers at the beginning of your presentation, mm -hmm. especially if you look at older people and much more susceptible to dizziness, right, uh, and so forth. So also, you talked about this being an application that might be more attractive to those that have difficulty with maintaining a regimen, especially a boring regimen. Yeah. Well, I think I think about older people, and they're much more likely to stay with something for a longer period of time than a younger audience. Uh, for example, learning to play the piano as an older person because you're just committed, that's what you want to do and you'll stay with it. Sure. And if you look at other exercise programs that older people might undertake and willing to stay with it, let's say Tai Chi mm -hmm. is an example, which yep. is very popular with older people and some of the same, looking for some of the same benefits, mm -hmm. i.e. improve their balance and their movement and so forth. So my question after a long uh, comment is an integrated practice how you might integrate this use uh, along with someone who's practicing Tai Chi or yoga or some other movement so they're not having to make a choice but might integrate it into their practice. To what extent have you looked at some of those applications? Yeah, no, absolutely. So one of the side benefits that we didn't get into is that every video game now is, uh, is, is internet connected, which means as a clinician, I'm not now sending you off with a set of exercises that I don't know if you do them or not, I can say, Mr. Jones, I see that you did your exercises on Wednesday, Tuesday, and Thursday, but you didn't do them on Monday and Friday. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna encourage you to do it on those days, and I'm going to adjust the parameters of the game remotely to make it a little more challenging in the things that you're finding easier, and a little, bit, um, a little less challenging to give you a chance to sort of catch up. So in opening up that communication path, you can easily then integrate other kinds of therapies and other kinds of exercise and activities. One of the best exercises you can do for balance is what we call mall walking where you're walking in a straight line, looking side to side as you go. But again, you have to get somebody to the point where they can do that. And so the idea of this is to try to, is to, try to bring them again up to a more normal level. But for all of us, we can always benefit from you know, staying active you know, into, into our senior years to keep the system tuned. Another thing I will say too, if, if I can, um, is the beauty of virtual reality is we can change the environment to whatever you want. Right now, we just chose a camping scene because that we thought that'd be the most engaging just to get people hooked in. But like you're saying with Tai Chi, like people do that outside mostly, right? You can change the environment to be more of like a daytime environment or like the mall walking. We can just walk down and grab stuff from the shelves. The, the possibilities are limitless with virtual reality and augmented reality as well, because you just have to develop the different little assets. You place them in the world and then you upload it to the Oculus and that's it. So sure. it's definitely a, a very, um, there's a lot of opportunity there to change it up. So it's pretty cool. All right, I have a question from our folks on the Zoom. Can you briefly elaborate on the tools used previously, Unity, et cetera? What vendors are tied to in order to scale this past prototype? And then Ron would like to know in follow-up to that, any potential for collaboration with the X Labs on platforms and technologies? So one of the interesting things is the first thing I have all of the students do when they're entering into the project is take the X-Labs course on virtual reality. So it kind of is a great way, it's great boot camp to get them up, up and running very quickly. Um, as far as the build environment, yeah, I'll let you speak a little yeah. bit towards that. So we used Unity to do it. Uh, basically we had our, we have a dedicated um, developer. Um, he basically is a CS student who changed to ISAT, who specialized in Unity development. So he's the one that built the environment in there, and he designed all the assets uh, in a program called Blender, which is just a 3D modeling program. Um, so he designed them in there, and then he added um, the, the, the skin, if you will, basically the, the textures on there. And he transported them over to Unity by just transferring the file over. So Unity was very inclusive in being able to include all the, the 3D modeling work and also the, the code and the scripts behind it. It's built into the Unity editor. Um, so everything was integrated into, its, into um, itself. And like Dr. Spindel was saying with the VR class in X Labs, that's where I learned how to use Unity because I've never used it before. And that kind of helped me to understand what was happening inside the system under the hood, even though I didn't develop it, but I could still look at the scripts and look at the assets and be like, I know exactly what that's doing there. I know what this is doing there. So Karina and her team are actually in that class right now, 
and Carter and his team took it in the spring of last year. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. This technology to you mentioned 65 and 70 year olds. Right. How do you market to them that they might not know what this is? Yeah. Well, there, there's a lot of different methods to get into that marketplace, one of which is obviously the, cl the clinician. The clinician, <laughs> dizzy people are not the favorite patients of ENTs and family medicine people. They want the problem solved and move on. It's not easy, it's something easily medicinally treated. And so, um, so if uh, family medicine and ENT folks know about this and can present it as an alternative to cawthorn Cooksey exercises, and that's one of the reasons why going to the Vestibular Imbalance Society meeting is so important because it puts us out right in front of the, 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 clinical, the clinicians and the researchers who are doing this. Um, if, we, if they know about it, then they would, very, uh, they would be our primary marketing folks as well. Unfortunately, we're at time, so thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity. I needed to talk to you and um, tell you about what we are doing in South Africa. So, 
Uh, first, I'm going to introduce you to me. I am Mujadi Choshi. I'm faculty here at the School of Nursing. I, uh, my other uh, project faculty are Dr. Okindibe in engineering and Dr. Lewis in the School of Nursing and at, at the X Lab. What we are doing in South Africa is we have partnered with a community in the rural South Africa where we are uh, building a, um, a mobile health education system. So I want to tell you a little bit here about where uh, our partners are. So here is Limpopo. This is the map of South Africa, north. Most people know of Cape Town, north of South Africa. This is where we are. The village we're working with is right here. It is very remote. So this road, this is this main city at the, at the, of the Limpopo is about 35 miles from here to here. You go this R521, you turn here, all the way from here to here is all gravel. Yeah, there is no, uh, it's no tar road over there. So, um, to give you a little bit about the geographical context of where the, our partners are, is um, you go through the R521, you turn left. The minute you turn left to go to, the, to, to Marue, this is the road you take to get there. It is, um, so it is a rural road. So compared to when we talk about rural roads here in the US, thinking about um, Skyland Drive uh, is about 35 miles an hour to go through Skyland Drive. So here from the city to the village is almost 35 miles. Going through this road, it could take you almost about two hours because of the road. So, and then you can see over here, it's a big hole over here. This is a bridge that is almost broken. So during the rainy season, no one can go in or out of the village. So here, the different uh, seasons. In the summer, it can be really hot and very deserty, which is also impacting the access to resources like basic needs, things that people need. A little bit about who we are. I am a member of the community. When I'm saying we now, I'm shifting to talk about us as uh, a community. So this group of people here is, we call them Akurutama. It's a group of elders that control whatever happens in the, in the village. Uh, you can see myself here. Uh, you can see the chief. And this gentleman who's sitting over there is the uh, chair of the youth league in the village. So. Um, in 2018, I, that's when I started working at JMU. I went to this group of elders and asked their permission to come and talk about them here in, in my job. About, um, because as a community, we have been working for as long as I can remember on building our capacity, having our access to care and how we can to get there. So I wanted to see if I can involve my place of work and see how we can, that relationship can move us forward. Um, my story is, uh, I was born and raised in that village. I went to school in that village. My uh, worldview is shaped by my experiences in that village. I have a close, close personal relationship to the impact of living the indigenous way of life and the western way of life what i'm talking about is you look here you cannot even see my mother my mother is right here she is 102 years old she still lives the um the uh, the way of life of planting her own food um and eating everything that she has planted on the other side as we move from that way of life into the western way of living uh, the impact thereof made me lose about three of my, my brothers, actually. I have lost this brother over here. I don't know if you can see. She, he was 62 when he died. I lost this brother here, uh, that is his wife, when he was 50, when he was 45 years old. I lost another brother, uh, I don't have his picture here, when he was uh, uh, 55. All from the consequence of um, Western way of living, the lifestyle, the life choices that uh, we have. So, in 2019, 
uh, after I have had some communications in my department in School of Nursing and talked with other departments uh, throughout JMU, uh, me and my co-worker went to uh, the village. We communicated with the, the group of elders, talked about their objectives and their priorities and what their basic needs are, and then built some relationship uh, from that standpoint. In on that time as well, when we were there, we went to the University of Limpopo. We established some collaborations with, uh, with the School of Nursing in the, in the university. So from our partnership with the people in the village, in 2021 fall, we, we completed a course which was designed for the engineering students and for the nursing students. So this was a really um, high level of student engagement where the student engaged the community. They talked to the community through WhatsApp, through uh, Zoom, and they uh, asked them what the, the priorities are and asked them all kind of questions. It was um, a great relationship to see and then to expose our students to that level uh, because some, sometimes with the traditional way of teaching or educating our students, they don't have such uh, uh, experiences and engagement. Um, the outcome of that uh, class that we taught in fall 21, the, the student, after they teamed up with the community, they came up with four big ideas. And then they presented those ideas to the community. Here you can see Dr. Okundibe over there. Uh, Dr. Lewis is somewhere in this group, but I can't see her. Uh, they were presenting their final uh, projects to the community as well. And then next slide here, you can see me over there with the community watching the presentation. I was at home in December. So there's a little uh, laptop here. They're trying to hover over and watch what is uh, going on. So out of all the uh, presentations, the ideas that the student presented to the community, the one that, that received um, a significant amount of approval and a higher possibility of being adopted was a health education system that could uh, help the people improve their, um, their health outcomes. I'm actually really excited about this, this project, to be honest with you. And then uh, as, a, as a team, we are really excited to see the impact of this project on the people's quality of life. And then because it is centered around their priorities and also around their um, contextual factors, uh, really, because the design was based on, on them, on what they need. So we came up with this design uh, for, the, for, the, for the people and thinking that on top over here, we will have some solar panels and then over here, we will have a cooking station or whatever station we can, this station could be, uh, could be taken off if we have a cooking station or it could be something else. And then whatever is happening here could be transmitted over here with a big screen TV or, uh, uh, over here and then have some speakers here uh, uh, where someone is speaking. It could be tr uh, transcribed to here with closed captioning. The closed captioning would be with the native language because most of the people in the village, they don't speak English. They do speak uh, native language, we call it Sipedi. So then we will have some translation that is tr uh, CC'd over here. And then over here would be some storage here. And then here have some people uh, giving us some pamphlets on that, uh, uh, on this stage. People could sit here. The other interesting thing about that is, going, that is really exciting about this is we go into incorporate music into this uh, uh, design. The music comes up in terms of in our way of life, I mean in South African way of life, is we do uh, send our messages through music and then that way people can internalize and absorb the knowledge as we educate them through music on this one. So um, the final one here is this will be the uh, final uh, model with the bigger wheels here to go through those uh, uh, all gravel road. Impilo and here just mean good quality of life. As I don't know you, you know that in South Africa we have 11 official languages, but uh, uh, English is the mode of, uh, of speaking between each other. So 
quality of life, have this travel through the village, maybe depending on where we are to the neighboring villages as well to see you know, if, how that works. Budget wise, what we intend to do is we are planning to go into the village, go to South Africa, talk to more people, uh, uh, create more relationships. And then um, if we can, we might buy some of the equipment with us here, take them with us to South Africa, depending on the budget that we have or what we can do. And then prototype that, build that unit and see how much it could uh, impact the people. Uh, translate some of the, the students' material that they would have developed into uh, the native language of Siperi and then test it and see how it will work if it is impacting people's lives, you know, in that way. Because we have talked to the CEO of the hospital where we see that there's a, a huge number of people with diabetes so that we can check how that is impacting the people, check how, mu how many people have um, recepted that and then make some behavioral changes based on our uh, idea. That's, uh, that's about all I have for you. If you have any questions. So we'll open the floor to questions. Could you talk a little more about the student involvement in, in the various steps of the, of the project? Okay, so what, from where we started, we started with a group of students who are the teams in the fall 21. So we, in that class, we have four teams that developed, each, each group developed a, a, um, an idea based on what they communicated with the group. So the group, the teams were, they were assigned group members of the community. Uh, members. So they talked to each other, they came up with an idea and said, this is the idea that we came up with. And then also, after they came up with this, I, four ideas didn't just come out right away. They came up with ideas, went back to the community, and the community said, no, that's not going to work for us. And then they came back and then talked about it, what can we do? The student engagement was really uh, impressive to see because uh, of the time constraint, the time difference between South Africa and here. South Africa is about eight hours, nine hours uh, uh, ahead of us. And then uh, trying to establish within themselves when they can meet uh, with the people, the language also, which was a barrier, the students were able to look into through some of the presentations that the student had, they had to incorporate some of the music that uh, uh, people in the village played to them and said, this is the type of the music that we play in South Africa. And then um, they also, when they, uh, they talked to some of the people, one of the community members was also is trying to have a business in terms of having a chicken business. So the students were able to talk to that person about how to come up with a, a business plan, how to write a business plan. And uh, also some of the um, reflections that we have from the students, one of the students saying he, he or she intends to work in a group project as an engineering student. And then the experience that she had from this class is going to share with some of the team members in that um, perspective. I have a Zoom question. Actually, I have two. We'll start with the first one. Are there similar past programs that can be used to benchmark anticipated participation by these communities? To, to the mobile concept is not new to these rural villages. However, they were not as much as engaging as our project that we have. Most of the, the project, the mobile services that I have experienced and see and are still happening now is, is like it's a one-way process. The people come and they tell the community, this is what we are going to give you. This is what we think you need. In this perspective, is going to be tested with the community. It was designed with the community involvement. Uh, and also, when we test it, they are going to give us feedback on, it, on if it's going to work or it's not going to work. And we're going to uh, modify it based on that, okay. on that feedback. The second Zoom question we have is, have you thought about partnering with people looking to do vaccine rollouts, et cetera? We haven't uh, thought about uh, partnering with those people yet. 
but that that is something that we can look into we can explore that those relationships based on uh, feedback that you've gotten from the community what would be an example of something that you could deliver through this project that that community would find most impactful? What are their priorities? Are there some examples? Yes. The uh, examples are we have uh, a higher number of death rates depend in terms of stroke, uh, diabetes. So examples, people at, ho at home in the village, they don't have, our, uh, for instance, our stable food is high in carbs. We have a lot of, of corn, corn meal, and stuff like that. People are interested in saying, because we are not able to plant our own veggies, what is available for us to help us modify what we have, and then we can live a better life. Because they do see a lot of community members dying from diabetes. Some of them have um, uh, um, their legs amputated as complications of that. Some of them are debilitated due to stroke, high blood pressure, not ma heart disease that is heart failure that is not managed. They can see that amongst uh, themselves, and then they are looking at ways to see how they can improve and not let that happen to them. I think, first of all, admirable um, mission here. I think you've got the advantage of the community support, uh, obviously with your own credibility. If you think about the project, uh, what what are your biggest concerns that of uh, barriers that may get in the way of the success? My biggest concern is um, the beliefs, the people's beliefs at home. The belief, the the some people still believe in witchcraft. Some people might say, I have, my leg is not healing because I've been, wished, I've been bewitched. So to bridge that gap is going to be a challenge for me as a person as well. I think that is my biggest challenge. <coughs> so, yeah, could you elaborate on the, the, the current relationship that the nursing school here has with the university there? To what extent is, is that uh, being leveraged in this area, or what areas are they, are they collaborating in? The, the initial plan was to include them in teaching this course in Fall 21. Mm -hmm. So the challenge was they didn't have, uh, the students were not in the school. They couldn't be able to engage because of COVID-19. And then also the students in South Africa have where they access internet at the school, but they couldn't go to school to access the internet. The plan is for us, when we, the students go here, we're going to partner our students with the students in the school and, uh, in the University of Limpopo. So they can help with, it, with the language and also help with them uh, mixing in or into the communities and communicate better and blend in sort of. That's the relationship we're trying to establish. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So real quick, for those of us in person, we will be breaking for lunch. For our friends on Zoom, just like before at this break, you will have a 15-minute window where you'll be able to go to the breakout rooms and interact with our last presenters. And we will reconvene here at 1.15 so we can start promptly at 1.20. So thank you all. Thank you.
Oh, that's what I was going to say. So you use the far right. Yeah,
I know. Well, just from a sense of purpose standpoint, it's probably not good for your health. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Tired. coughs> <Right. coughs> so we're going to go ahead and start back after lunchtime, and we'll start by welcoming Dr. Nicholas Brennan, who's going to talk to us today about the constructs of local knowledge. Hi, everyone. Actually, John, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> But I'm an architect and uh, architectural professor um, here at JMU. Um, and so, yeah, the, the title of this is Constructs of Local Knowledge. Let's see if we can get this to move. And so as architects, um, we communicate our currency is uh, through drawings. So I'm going to try to present this information and sort of the synthesis of what I'm trying to do through several diagrams and drawings. So please bear with me. But the basis of this research um, in sort of in the Harrisonburg community and area is to take the Department of Forestry um, and some of the stewardship they're working with, students at JMU and academic programs, and public works and community-based projects. So another diagram to illustrate this event diagram. Is to, so we see JMU community projects, Virginia Department of Forestry, and bringing those together, what might we get? And so we do get a knowledge exchange. Um, resourcefulness and intrinsic value. And thinking of that as sort of a formula, um, adding all those together, really focusing on knowledge exchange comes intrinsic value, um, which through architecture students working with the community, we will get stronger relationships between JMU and the community, students working as activists within their community, um, strengthening public spaces by using some of the materials um, from the Virginia Department of Forestry that I'll discuss in a moment, and, uh, and taking those lo uh, local materials and rerouting them and reusing them um, for community-based projects rather than sending them to the landfill or out as mulch. So it begins with this little guy, which there's a lot of them. Um, the uh, EAB wood or emerald ash borer is a big problem for ash. It'll probably turn into a situation like the American chestnut where this, this will no longer be around, or very few. Um, this bug basically crawls into the tree, lays a bunch of eggs, kills the, the tr um, bark of the tree, which is a very protective aspect of the tree, and ultimately spreads very fast and can decimate the um, population of this species. So in the past few years, between 2018 and 2021, over 1,200 EAB ash trees have been taken down as they're trying to protect some of these. And the question is, where does that wood go? So you have huge uh, chunks of lumber, and they're typically chopped up or sent to a landfill or reused as mulch. Um, but the idea is you have to get rid of them, otherwise they'll keep spreading and protect the ones you can protect. So um, this past fall, I reached out to the Department of Forestry and Harrisonburg Public Works and to learn a little bit more about this and, um, and got some wood donated. So we have about 60, uh, 60 boards, um, roughly from 10 to 12 feet long. And, you know, and so I need to do something with that. So my background is in um, architecture and teaching in New York for probably the past 15 years and recently moving here before COVID. And I'm very big into design build education. So to, to kind of give a, um, a different illustration of this, would we send a doctor out without ever having talked to patients or having some kind of experience? And the answer is no. So same thing with architecture students. The notion of a design build education is to learn from an experience rather than just this flow of, of information or lectures. And so a typical architecture studio, students get a project, it's most of the time conceptual, and they design really cool things, and they're, they're you know, encouraged to be ambitious. And, um, and the question of consequences, um, empathy, community, sometimes, you know, it, it's, it's on the peripheral. And so I call that like a single axis way of working. They're at their desk, they're working on their project. Design build does something different. Um, it's multi-axial. So it's students working together, operating like an office would, uh, various students taking on different roles in the, um, in the design build project. And the idea is they will take the design, go through the steps an office would, or simulate it with a professor, someone like myself, 
and start with schematic design, client engagement, um, working with each other, schematics, iterations, to then end up ultimately building the project. And so that becomes very multi-axial. Um, and even outside of the classroom, it becomes multi-axial because they're dealing with client engagement, city agencies, and all those other, um, you could say constraints or restrictions, codes, things like that. And then ultimately on-site building, the resistance of materials, understanding what lumber can do, what plywood can do, what metal can do. Um, so it's very participatory. So I had that free lumber I received last fall and I started to think, and you know, JMU is such a great place and there's a tremendous amount of trust in the program to let instructors like myself kind of bring together and synthesize certain types of studios. So reaching out to Jeremy, who's at uh, Harrisonburg Public Works, um, Joe Lennon, who's with the Virginia Department of Forestry, a lot of facilities, mainly Jeannie Cook and Gary Shears, who are facilities who are all about safety and what we can do on campus. Um, we started to think about what kind of project could this lumber um, help out with. And my area coordinator mentioned there was a, and so this is gonna get, go into a small story. We have a, a facilities manager who takes care of our buildings, but she had mentioned to my area coordinator that she had started a bike program directly across the street from our building. So think right behind Greenberries over on West Gray Street. And so right there, there's an occupational therapy group that brings in JMU students and they provide a service to the community, mainly children. And these children have maybe learning disabilities, uh, might be somewhere on the spectrum in terms of autism, or might have had some trauma. Some have come in with, from having a stroke. In any case, the students in this group, the Occupational Therapy Clinical Education Services Group, um, provides this to the community and these children come in to hone and repair their fine and gross motor skills. And so back to Wendy, who takes care of our spaces, she volunteers and she's a mechanic. At the same time, she works for JMU. And she started a program finding bicycles and taking donated bicycles to get these young students and clients and um, patients to start to repair these bicycles, which works on their fine motor skills, but then to learn how to ride these bicycles right there in the parking lot. And she, you know, she was basically telling my area coordinator that they kind of do this out in the middle of the parking lot with no shelter and the bikes are kind of exposed to the elements. My area coordinator mentioned this to me and I said, that's perfect. That's perfect for this uh, material that we just rescued. So long story short, I, ha I have students that I teach this semester and I got in touch with every single um, administrator at the um, Occupational Therapy um, Clinical Sur Education Services Group and started a studio. So this was my studio, or this is my studio currently. We have met with the um, administrators and listen to their needs and aspirations. And the students began to start running like an office. We started to take on different roles from foot photography and archiving to uh, keeping a schedule for everyone, basically running like an office. And we started to hear their needs, which was bicycle storage, tools, things uh, such as surfaces, seating for various types of children who might be in wheelchairs or have certain um, uh, imbalance or any kind of difficulty, and how do we design this place for them to repair bicycles, but yet can also keep those bicycles um, protected. And so we listened to all of this and began to think about, um, oops, a little too soon, began to think about what the design would be. They also mentioned, hey, can you build a sensory ramp for us since you guys are design build students? And we said yes, and they sent us some specs. And the students, right, we looked at it and it's 500 bucks. And we started to really realize that um, occupational therapy equipment across the board is just more expensive than normal toys because it's specialized and, and it seemed a little bit backwards to us. In any case, we took this design, the students built, built it within a day. They went to the sh down to the shop, we had some leftover plywood and they built it. And being design students, we started to question, how can we make this better? This, the scooters, these little kind of boards with wheels have to go somewhere. Um, who lifts this? Who's, you know, how is this? interesting for the, the young person kind of moving on it. And the students, you know, our, the attitude that I try to, um, the ethos within the studio is to think, how can we take something ordinary, think about its capacity and elevate it to something extraordinary. 
And so the students began to you know, flex their design muscles, started building models, started talking with each other, forming groups, where can they begin to add that value of functionality? They started prototyping, working together in the shop, and we delivered this to them at our first design meeting for the, um, for the bicycle station. And they loved it. Like there's storage underneath, there's identity to it. It's colorful, it's playful. It's actually added function with multiple handles, including the text. Um, and the students began to learn about the tools that they have in the wood shop, CNC routers, um, certain types of software, et cetera, and also hardware. How do you, they, there's some hinges in there that allow it to come apart and be stored easily. So it was a good warm up for the first two weeks of this semester. Um, along with that, working with Joe, who's at the Department of Forestry, and Jeremy, the way this, the ash typically comes down on site and mobile mills are brought out to mill that. And those are local business people um, providing this service, which I'm sure they've been inundated you know, this past winter. But the students got to see this, see their material from the raw begin to become dimensioned, right? A material that they will build with. So it was really educational for us to see this on site right near the, near the building. Um, and since then, we've been designing. We've been having professional meetings with the clients, with um, the administration, with student, the, the occupational therapy students who are working directly with children and coming up with different designs. So these are just some of those images we've been presenting um, and it's still in progress. And we just had a meeting this week um, looking at a design that has this ability to expand and then sort of conflate or come back together to store the bicycles. So with that said, um, I've been thinking about this because the lumber is free. And in fact, the JMU Ar Arboretum has recently just taken down 10 oak trees. Um, and they called and asked, do you, do you want this? And Jeremy at, at Public Works asked, do you want this? And I said, yeah, let me see if I can get some money to get the mills. The, the main cost is to get a mill and to cut it. Um, but the, the Arboretum is also in need of a new bridge. And so I started to think in connecting dots, similar to what I've done for this studio, um, connecting dots thinking, could that wood be cut down, removed from site, milled and brought back to the site right there at the Arboretum to build the bridge? And could that potentially be one of the projects? So. What I'm asking for is about $11,000 um, for three years, basically three spring semesters of this type of studio. The material is free. So what that money would be going to is something that can build up public spaces, local community gardens, potentially certain structures, um, planting beds, things like that, shade structures, or local parks and trails. So going back to that 11,000, um, 1,500 of it would be used for three student researchers, one per semester. And they would be just working a few hours a week with me to reach out to, you know, kind of keep things, um, keep things going if I'm not on campus or something. Um, it would also go to milling. So there are local businesses, and I think it would be great to support them in this endeavor with the, the reuse or rescuing of this material to get them involved. Um, and, and keep them going in terms of taking down this, this valuable resource. And then lastly, there are other things that are needed in assembly, fasteners, finishes, some protectant coatings, uh, uh, coatings that can um, protect the wood so it, it, uh, a structure can last much longer, and other types of materials. Um, and so this would also be broken down uh, 5,500 over the course of three semesters. And lastly, um, just a little bit of money, I would like to also investigate other schools and institutions and businesses that are doing this type of work with this valuable material or resource. And maybe think of publications and conferences where we can put this out there, see who's doing this in different regions and, um, and ultimately potentially try to get bigger and better projects. Some of those um, that we're currently talking with the Harrisonburg Public Works about are working with the United Way or Habitat for Humanity locally, um, and also the um, Harrisonburg uh, Parks and Recreation Department. Um, I think that covers everything. Yeah. Questions for Nick? Kevin? Yes, thank you for the presentation. Um, so, 
the three projects, the I assume the students will be involved in the design of the structures, and how does that weave its way into the the curriculum that that you teach? Yeah. Um, well, the students would be involved. They might not have so much say at the beginning of a semester what the project might be, but I would like the researchers to be involved with identifying what those projects could be. So. To answer the question, the students will be involved from start to finish in whatever the project is. In selecting the projects, I'm currently talking with um, Jeremy Harold down at uh, Harrisonburg Public Works. And in fact, he's bringing in the city manager, um, Andy Banks, to, we're actually having a meeting with them, with the students and everyone, to uh, discuss future projects in Harrisonburg. What public works, what public spaces, community needs there are, where this, this how should I say, it, this reciprocity, this system could, start to, um, to work like a machine. So I don't know what those projects are yet, but I do know what they could be um, in terms of scale, the capability of the students, the materials we have. It's, to me, it's a formula that I need, you know, as an instructor and doing the research, have to formulate what projects down the line can we work with year to year. But the students, they're eager, they're tenacious, and I don't really think they care what it is. It could be a garage. <laughs> and they will want to design it. They're eager to get something built in the world after building so many little paper models and drawings, things that are conceptual. So I hope that answers the question. It does. Thank you. Yes. Are there other learning outcomes? I mean, I, you start thinking about recycling and, and uh, wood and, and the like in terms of, you know, green projects. And again, part of probably is part of your curriculum if you look at architecture. So yeah. how are, are there some other learning outcomes beyond uh, the design build project? Absolutely. So I teach another class called materials and methods. And, um, and obviously we cover everything from steel to nanoparticles and stuff. But something that I really emphasize is actually it's, it's a newer technology. It's taking CLT um, and LVLs. These are cross laminated timber and lumber and large buildings are being made out of this. This is a fairly new movement. There's an apex building, which is brand new in Charlottesville. Um, and I believe it's nine stories. And it's, it went to, I watched it go together. It went together like Japanese joinery, all made out of wood. And I mean, I, you can do more research. It's very safe. Uh, this type of building is much safer than steel because the wood has a protective coating once it gets charred and, and fire can only penetrate it so much, where steel will fail and melt and, and fall. So, there is this technology, and as students are learning this in my materials and methods class, which they had last fall, they're now putting their hands on lumber um, and timber to, to learn about this material. And it's, to me, it's heavy. To now know what this material can do is a burden, because no longer can you design the things that just sort of float and dreamy. There's now this negotiation between what you know materials can do, this knowledge, which is a part of their DNA now, and then what their ideas will be into the future. And I think that kind of balance is needed in, um, needed in architecture. Yeah. yeah. If I could just have another second answer to that. <laughs> There's also, along with, because I, I think you're asking a very valuable question of what other learning outcomes of sustainability. And just to kind of steer from sustainability, there is this professionalism I'm seeing from 21 year olds building this, reaching out to the clients, scheduling meetings. I think that's just this other value along with designing with each other and sitting and iterating and creating and making things and getting dirty. They're learning how to communicate, how to listen. I mean, these, I guess you call them soft skills, which I think are very important for architects also. Um, that too is typically not taught in architecture school. It's like, one day you want to be an architect, go out and run a business. Who's, going to, who's teaching them that? So I think it gives them this, this um, uh, exposure to the world and how um, they can engage with that world. And I think it'll come back, right? I think this sort of work with community will come back as they go find a professional job or you know, design one of those bigger buildings. It'll come back. Um, question from the Zoom, it's one of our folks that were here with us last year that saw a presentation we had with students in, in Colwards College that are using styrofoam to make concrete, mm. a, a lighter weight concrete, yes. and they were just wondering, is there a potential cross between the work that your students are doing and the work that those students are doing to create alternative materials for yeah. construction? Absolutely. Um, 
we do have another studio going that is also working with concrete. Um, the Southeastern Concrete Conference, I, I can't remember the last letter, but uh, that studio is actually designing for a competition, Habitat for Humanity Houses. And so we've actually had an exchange just within our own program um, where the students get to see the demonstration for concrete and, and the applications for cement, concrete, mixtures, and those students seeing what we're doing working with lumber. Now, for other students in, in other programs in the university, absolutely. I mean, I know there's a ton of work going on, um, and so we would be open to that because that other, uh, let's take this one, the materials and supplies is funding for the other. It, it's funding for, do we wanna work with fabrics, the woven arts, the fiber arts, do we wanna work with masonry or synthesis of certain materials and so that that particular part i know it's so short and materials and supplies would be open to those types of investigations thank you for that thank you, thank you. We next have Paula Pogle and Sarah Brody with Be Seen, Be Heard. Oh. Here you go. Sean's our clicker. <laughs> Good afternoon. We are excited to present Be Seen, Be Heard, a podcast created and sponsored by Women for Madison to lift the voices of sex successful and influential JMU women. My name is Paula Polglace, and I serve as a senior development officer on our strategic gifts team. Hi, I'm Sarah Brody. I'm a graphic designer on the advancement marketing team. And Paula and I, in addition to our regular JMU jobs, volunteer as Women for Madison staff. And we thank you all for giving us your day today, at both those of you in the room and those of you on Zoom. So we asked some people around campus about podcasts, and this is what we heard. Oh no, we have no sound. Oh no, this is bad.
don't think it's started. It's good. We'll go to the next slide. So that was a lot of good feedback about <laughs> <laughs> when people listen to podcasts and what kind of topics they listen to. And uh, there were some diverse answers, which I wish you guys could have heard. Um, so, but let's talk about just how popular are podcasts. 80 million people listen to podcasts every week. Um, and COVID over the last two years has dramatically increased the number of listeners. Um, and the audience is more diverse than ever, as are the topics of podcasts. And people listen to podcasts um, a lot of the time when they're home, but also when they're in the car, when they're walking to and from, when they're exercising. People listen anytime they can because podcasts are very accessible. In fact, podcasts are now a mainstream source of entertainment and information for many Americans. Um, I want to quote a 2020 article that I think sums it up well. Active people love passive content, the one that lets you do something else while you're listening to your favorite new episode. Podcasts are not just the present, they are the future. This chart shows the growth in podcast listeners from 2013, which happens to be the year Women for Madison was founded, to January 2021. And you can see the steady upward trend that podcasts are enjoying with millions more people tuning in every year. And with the diversity in topics that are out there and people who are listening, this, this trend is not gonna end anytime soon. So our efforts with Women for Madison are also on the rise. We were created as a pro program to honor and sustain women's philanthropy at JMU and we are in our ninth year showing unparalleled success. We implemented, implemented a major restructuring 18 months ago, and we really decided to focus on our philanthropic mission to support JMU students. So we launched the Amethyst Circle in 2021 with the goal of 10 founding members who would give $15,000 to establish this fund and a goal of 200 women who would give $5,000 every two years so that we could donate a million dollars every two years to support student scholarships. Currently, we have 65 founders and 125 Amethyst Circle members on our way to 200. The most exciting part, we met with the foundation this week and have been assured that the first of our funding is going to support our incoming 2022 students. We've also expanded our program programming. Um, we started with one in-person event in 2014. And from that, we've added more and more programs over the years. We were able to pivot during COVID and we offered um, three webinars as well as a two day virtual summit all within the last 18 months. So we really think the Be Seen, Be Heard podcast is a natural next step for women pr for Madison. We're interested in marrying the popularity of podcasts with the, with the rise in participation in Women for Madison. We can really take advantage of the attraction of podcasts as we engage with our constituents wherever they are, whenever it is um, uh, convenient for them. So we'll be able to connect listeners even better to the Women for Madison mission more frequently and more seamlessly than ever before. The Be Seen, Be Heard podcast will spotlight high achieving JMU women speaking candidly about their lives, their experiences, um, really telling their stories and giving their advice. Our podcast, our intention is to feature powerful female voices in candid dialogue, but these experiences and issues will really reach a broader audience that everybody can relate to. So let's imagine it's Saturday afternoon. Um, you have a lot of work to do around the house. And to make that a little bit more bearable, you click on the Be Seen, Be Heard podcast. Soon you're listening to JMU alumna Lindsay Zarniak share her story of her career journey from, to, from being a sports reporter to a sports anchor and then on the, on the um, sideline reporter. 
Or maybe your daughter calls in the middle of her run. She's listening to Be Seen, Be Heard, and she had to pause it and call you because she can't wait to tell you to tune in to listen to 1993 alum, alum Jocelyn Nicole Johnson, who just wrote a book called My Monticello that really dives into issues like racism, climate change, what it really means to build community. Or maybe you sit in your driveway for an extra 10 minutes um, to finish listening to softball coach Lauren Laporte talk about the 2021 Cinderella season for her team and all the lessons that they learned from that. So here's our plan to make those kind of moments happen. We'd like to launch the Be Seen, Be Heard podcast in January 2023, and we'll produce a new 30 to 45 minute episode every two months. We feel like this is a manageable schedule based on our resources and the learning curve that we're gonna face. In order to build our listener base and a sense of momentum, we're gonna take the episodes, condense them, repackage them as mini casts or micro casts the month after they're released. So there will be something released every single month. We will plan to be very deliberate in choosing inclusive podcast topics that will resonate with a broader audience. Um, not just women. Within the Women from Madison community alone, we have many resources to tap for hosts and guests. Um, we have psychologists and other healthcare professionals. We have sports figures, C-level executives, life coaches, authors, and entrepreneurs. We will also create a feedback loop to solicit our listener suggestions for future topics and guests. We had a lot of success with that with our virtual summit. Be Seen, Be Heard will also allow us to spread the word about Women for Madison and the Amethyst Circle, spotlighting our scholarship recipients, announcing upcoming milestones, seminars, and our summit, and we can promote, promote, promote fundraising opportunities like our rallies, circles, and special events. Our funding request is heavily weighted towards staffing with additional outlays for branding and marketing, cloud-based storage, and equipment. We are very excited about the creation of these two positions for students. We feel this adds a, an even more meaningful and deeper dimension to our mission of supporting JMU students. Today we're requesting a total of $24,774 to launch and fund the pilot year of Be Seen, Be Heard. The student employees will assist with booking guests and interviewers and the logistics thereof. They will help with marketing, the podcast recording and post-production. And they're gonna need a shared computer for their work. We will submit the podcast to industry directories, which is how listeners will find it, and we'll promote it through social media ads. And we'll need to create the branding assets to support our marketing and advertising efforts and we'll have to obtain a secure web hosting service for the podcast. So we're dreaming big. Our goal is for Be Seen, Be Heard to be wildly popular in the JMU community and beyond. In year two, we'll seek campus partners to help us bring these podcast episodes to life. Women from Madison members, alumni owned businesses and local businesses will flock eagerly to sign up for advertising and sponsorship opportunities. The Be Seen, Be Heard podcast will help women from Madison reinforce our connection between student success, alumni engagement, and support for JMU. Your endorsement and funding of our podcast will build the launch pad and really give the vote of confidence that will encourage others to join us. Our ultimate goal with Be Seen, Be Heard and Women for Madison is to create a culture of philanthropy at JMU. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> We're prepared. Yes, sir. Great, great presentation and great mission. Uh, fantastic work, by the way. Um, Thank you. Thank you. What's your vision of connecting with other partners across JMU, uh, in particular the Alumni Association, to really bring this to scale? Yeah, I would, uh, great question. Um, I, 
I would say several different ways. Um, we have had great success in partnering with the Alumni Association, certainly um, with getting the word out, um, certainly with using their, their expertise. You know, they have literally a wealth of, um, I'll just go straight to alumni board members alone, um, chapter members. Um, you know, I think with anything we do at JMU, it's, you know, we don't know who we don't know. Um, so, so the more we can expand, you know, who we know, um, and the Alumni Association, I would say, would be uh, our top partner um, as, we, as we reach out um, and utilize those other campus partners. Um, campus partners, though, across the board, um, I'll give you an example. We did a great webinar uh, in last spring, I believe it was, um, on Title IX. Um, we partnered with the alumni or, or with uh, athletics to do that. Um, and then Marianne Alger was the host of that webinar. Um, so, so I think, you know, maybe it is who we are, but, but we are collaborative by nature. Yes. These are the presentations that we're hearing today. There are a couple of kind of common denominators. One is that they're student-centered. Really, how do you get students involved with them as they continue to grow? to their JMU experience. And the other is most of these projects are all based within an academic program. They've got a home, if you will. So in this case, although you mentioned a couple of students will be involved, this is, it, this is administratively based, coming out of the advancement office. Mm -hmm. So what's your response to those who wonder, number one, how do you get more students involved if it's kind of student-based? And it may not, be, may not be, but just your response to that. And second, what distinguishes this from any other advancement initiative that the university ought to be paying for as you're looking at engaging more uh, members of alumni and other members of the community in becoming involved with, with, with JMU? I think that the, the, the podcast is going to function on several levels. Um, so as far as student involvement, of course, initially we have two student employees, and that's not a lot of people. but. We, we hope this will make an impact on their lives. Um, initially, that'll be the first level of involvement. Um, by elevating, um, you know, JMU voices that we're going to tap into the expertise, we are going to support um, our new status um, as an R2 institution, being seen for who we are. We really feel that this is going to help JMU at large as well um, as we appeal to you know, one of the slides said we've got 150,000 living alumni, 40,000 parents. Um, the word will spread about JMU. That will help also with recruiting efforts, we feel, and our overall reputation. But our main thrust at Women for Madison is to get the money in for scholarship dollars. And that's going to be where the biggest impact, um, we hope, from our efforts and the podcast is, is supplementary. I mean, Women for Madison has a lot of very enthusiastic people involved in it. And so um, I think that we can convey that through the podcast. We're going to attract more people to our events. And in the end, we, we want to support students through scholarships. I would say the second um, part of your question, having sat kind of on the side of the room <laughs> near where you're sitting, um, it, you know, the thing that all of these presentations you'll see has in common is probably you kind of come, you're like, wow, that's a great idea. Why doesn't JMU fund that? Um, so, so we're in that same boat. Um, you know, I, I think what we want to be is a Madison Trust success story. Um, we we want to be funded in year one and it, have it take off so that our campus partners and our alums and our business owners invest um, and so that we become a true, true success story kind of out there on our own. It will, and it won't be a drain on the university. I'll just add to um, Canyon with the women's Madison team. We do have a plan if, if the first year is successful, years you know, two, three, four, and five, we would like to look at some of the alumni partners we have to have there in our business directory, um, ask other people if they want to support it, run ads, have a sponsorship kind of thing. Um, I just actually was at lunch with an alum and was telling her about what we're doing today, and she's like, please let me know when you're ready after sure. to sponsor your first podcast. So I think there will be interest for people to, to sponsor it once we get going. Yeah. And, and just to kind of, that's our 
Zoom question as well from Cosetta's. Would you go first to individuals who are alumni to give them the opportunity to advertise their business on the podcast or to promote their company as an expertise as well? Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we are about JMU. Brandon. Have, has anyone else on campus, any other departments or anything, done anything similar to this or has an ongoing podcast? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Um, so, yes. Several uh, departments um, on campus are, we have a, a podcast called Democracy Now! through the Center for Civic Engagement. Um, we have the Health Center just started a podcast. Um, interestingly, our history, our students in the history department, um, I believe they take a class and are learning, learn these uh, techniques and, and about interviewing and podcasting. Um, we actually have several um, fairly successful alumni. Um, who I think we can use as a resource as well. Um, several around uh, athletics and sports alums that do this, as well as Lindsay Zarniak that we mentioned, Jennifer Morgan, Glennon Doyle, they, all alums that have successful podcasts. Yes. Yes. Um, thank you for the presentation, by the way. It's great stuff. Um, curious about, just, and if I missed it, I apologize, but can you talk a little bit more about the, the, the well-known host part of things, you know, podcasts, obviously, it's very important to have that continuity and, and you know, the successful podcasts out there, you got these people that, that were able to kind of run the show and, and, and be able to kind of have that continuity, asking great questions, engagement, etc. Can you talk a little bit more about that and, and what's being supported? One of our visions is to, um, when we pitch this to our executive advisory council, which is like the new AA board, um, the response was immediate and they were really excited about it. And I think there's some women on our council who actually have had experience with podcasts, we're very interested in it, and I think we would work with them and train them um, to be our hostesses. We really want to engage our our volunteers, engage our JMU alumni, and we think this is a really neat way to do that in a totally different way than we've used it before. Not everybody was for that. Nobody, some people are like, oh, I don't want my voice on, can't, on, you know, on a podcast. But there certainly were, I would say, five or six ladies who right away said, I would love to be trained to be a podcast host. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? All right. Well, thank you, Sarah and Paul. Thank you all. Yeah. Friends on Zoom, we will be instituting the two breakout rooms so you'll be able to speak with the last two speakers and get an opportunity to ask your questions of them. For those of us in the room, we have a break until 2.15. So thank you.
Oh, yeah. yeah, oh yeah, it does. It does. But it's amazing now, just having a little foothold. Again, we want to welcome Carol Fleming, Jen Amjil, and their project, Writing for the Future. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for taking the time to learn about our project, Writing for the Future. My name is Carol Fleming, an assistant dean with the School of Professional and Continuing Education. The school has a broad portfolio offering both credit and non credit programming. Part of that is servicing students in the K 12 system. We design our programs to act like a pipeline from kindergarten through 12th grade. And part of that is offering educational camps and programming that benefits students of all ages. One program we would like to add to that portfolio is writing for the future. Oh, um, it, for about 10 minutes, you'll learn about this exciting and new program that will be beneficial to JMU students, high school refugees, and JMU as a university, and hopefully one you'd like to support. Jen. Hi, my name's Jen Omdeld, and I'm a professor here in writing, rhetoric, and technical communication. 
And so we thought that it might help you to understand our focus on the refugee population by talking first about the impact the population has in our community. So since 2015, the Harrisonburg Immigration and Refugee Office, um, an arm of Church World Services, has helped with the resettlement of about 794 refugees to our community. And these refugees have fled their homes because of war, famine, political unrest, um, general threats of um, violence. We're seeing this play out right now in Ukraine, for example. And so 60% um, of the youth that are in the Harrisonburg High School come from families where English is not the first language spoken in their home. And of that percentage, another half of those students are um, expected to come from refugee-identified families. So um, after years working as the Youth Employment Coordinator for CWS, Rebecca Sprague, who's one of our partners on this project, has um, discovered that although the school has a lot of resources for students like this, students who are transitioning into these new spaces, that a real need um, continues to help refugees find good jobs um, and contribute to our local economy, and also to advise students on choosing part and full-time jobs that will help them to kind of um, figure out their long-term career goals and possibly college. So one of the first things we tell WRTC students uh, when they're writing about a project or an idea is to put a face on it. So I would like to introduce you to Rita. Rita, along with her family, um, is a, are refugees and have worked with CWS to transition into their new lives in the U.S. and here in Harrisonburg. Rita is the oldest daughter of a single mother. Her mother works two jobs to support the family and was only able to complete school to the third grade. Um, because of this, Rita has worked in jobs like McDonald's since she was 16 to help the family pay bills, but her dream is to be an RN. So Rita has, ooh, hold on a minute. Okay? I'm so sorry. Let me She's grab a chair. Now. I'm sorry. I'm recovering from a little stomach bug. Here, ooh. let me get it. I got it. Thank you. Let me just sit and then I will finish this. Such a good program, you guys. I'm not going to finish. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Woo. Um, so Rita has graduated from Harrisonburg High School and um, got accepted into college and received a scholarship. And in preparation for this, CWS staff um, suggested that she um, transition away from these like McDonald's and um, fast food jobs and apply instead for a part-time job at a uh, local healthcare facility. And so this kind of maneuver has um, really strengthened her college application um, and will likely help her get into a very competitive RN program. So what we'd like to do, and when Rita began this, this work, she really didn't know where to start as far as creating a CV or what a resume really should look like or what a more intense kind of interview process might look like beyond you know, those she had been doing at McDonald's. So we are hoping that we can provide this kind of career um, service and development to other youth in the area and also along the way provide some mentoring and leadership opportunities for JMU undergraduates. As you can see, Rita and other refugee students like her need to become self-reliant at a very early age. They need to integrate into the workforce right after high school. However, they may not always have those key valuable mentors to help them with those next steps. The goal of this program is to fill that gap, to provide guidance in strengthening their writing skills and their ability to not only break into the workforce, but to set them up for future success. So our plan then is to bring together the School of Professional and Continuing Education with their ties to K through 12 ed um, and the School of Writing, Rhetoric, and Tech Com and our expertise in professional writing. And these partners then would work with high schoolers who are being served by CWS. So the students in my class called Writing in the Community would prepare and guide six on-campus sessions for 15 high schoolers from this target population and the high schoolers um, would get feedback on reading and composing job-related materials. The high schoolers would also receive interview prep, and the final stage of the project would be an actual job fair um, with local employers. So the benefits of the program aren't limited to the high schoolers. Um, as this partnership, I think, really affords JMU undergrads an opportunity to, experience, um, to gain new experiences and build new skills. While our WRTC graduates are pretty sought after for their writing skills, it's a big uh, competency that uh, a lot of times employers are looking for, this experience would also allow them to gain um, 
project management, interpersonal communication, and training skills. So by organizing mock interviews and assisting the high school students in developing interview strategies, our undergraduates will practice teaching the concepts they themselves are learning. And this is a pedagogical approach that we love where um, it really cements for people new concepts um, by forcing them to kind of teach them to other folks. The undergraduates would also learn and deploy coaching methods for writing that are appropriate for academic, business, nonprofit, and other organizations. And this ability to go into a business and be a writing coach is also highly marketable. So we think that could be another skill that our students could take away from this. The on-campus sessions will provide opportunities to collaborate with those from very different cultures. And this feels pretty invaluable in our global economy. Importantly, this sort of community partnership fosters ideas of civic engagement that are bedrock to JMU's mission to develop educated and enlightened citizens, the kind of students and future professionals who strive not only for their success, but for that of others. So the timeline that we're envisioning is um, that the class would take place in spring 2023, and the first month of class would really be spent uh, with uh, preparing the undergraduates to work with very diverse populations and also get a better idea for the um, employment landscape in our community. In February and March, the high schoolers would be transported to campus for 90 to 120 minute sessions, and that would depend on what works best with their schedule as we continue with the program. These sessions would largely consist of one-on-one -on -one and small group mentoring to help high schoolers draft cover letters and CVs, prepare for interview questions, and even talk about proper interview attire. One session will also focus on college applications with JMU admissions folks coming to um, talk with high schoolers who might be prospective Dukes. In March, the undergraduates would organize a job fair and in doing so again, gain, I think, really important project management skills. And the final event will be a job fair at the Ice House in April, where we hope to attract at least eight local employers from a variety of industries to come and interview the students. To make writing for the future a success, we are seeking $14,530. As you can see from our budget, one of our line items is transportation. These students would need to be transported from the high school to Jamie's campus and back home again in the evening. Mm -hmm. The most um, expensive line item here is equipping these students with the right tools, which means purchasing 15 laptops that JMU will loan out during the duration of this program, and then we would have for future programs that we want to run sometime later. These students who often arrive here with very little, for these students that arrive here with very little, providing clothing for interviews is important. These students will visit the already existing JMU career clothing closet. So we're asking for funds to bolster the, what they offer there and have future clothes there for JMU students. We are providing snacks because these students are in school all day and will be with us until 6 or 6.30 at night. So we want to have some nutrition there for them during, the, during their time. We will have one lunch. It's always great to have high school students visit our campus dining halls to really experience what campus life is like. So we wanna make sure they have that experience. And then during the mini job fair that Jen talked about, we do wanna have a catered lunch for everyone that's there. So thank you for listening to us and we can take any questions you need. In closing, however, um, we are very excited about implementing this program. We're excited to engage high school refugee students in life-changing opportunity to witness the benefits this will bring to students, to refugee high school students, to our community, and to JMU. Relocating from their homes has been traumatic for these students. They are literally writing for their future, and together with JMU students, they're writing for all of our future. Thank you very much. Do you want to stay down? Oh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm going to stand down in case anybody has questions. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thanks for that presentation. Um, the high school students, how do they apply and how do you decide who's selected? Do you want to yeah, I can talk about that. Um, so we're working with Rebecca Sprague, who is um, over the Church World Services and works directly with these high schoolers. So she will actually be helping us put together a list of students that could benefit from this kind of work. Um, and helping us also make, I think, the really important connections to the families and getting students to feel kind of comfortable being part of the program. So we kind of have a direct pipeline through CWS to find these students. Thank you. Yes. 
given the schedule of the students in your class and given the schedule of the high school students, how do you align those so that they match? And in cases where they may not, where the high school students are still working toward the, the goals that they've set, how do you handle that transition in terms of where they are, are left off when the, the college student finishes the class? Great. You know, for I think in our I can speak to our program. Um, we have a lot of flexibility in how we can schedule the class, and I've worked with a form of this class probably for four or five years, and so students kind of come in understanding that it's not your regular seminar class, um, and so we'll talk with them about how we um, position the class um, so that it will really focus in on that 90 to 120 minute um, space that we need for the high schoolers. Um, and as far as the, um, you know, keeping those connections going, I think having Rebecca on our team would allow us to keep our um, college students in contact with the high school students. Um, a project that I did previously was also kind of working with uh, Carol's group. Um, we worked with young women um, in the middle schools. And so a lot of the girls, the women and men who were involved as Grad, or undergrad students, they ended up going on to volunteer to be big brothers and big sisters in these students' lives. So I find when we put students together, our wonderful undergrads and students from our community, the bond tends to go far beyond just the classroom space. I have two Zoom questions we're going to take. Actually, if it's okay with you, I'm going to answer the first one for you since I help facilitate sure. this conversation. <laughs> Robert Reichschneider asked, where is the career clothing closet? Okay. Is it all new clothes? Do they accept donations? And where is it? <laughs> and, and this is actually an outgrowth of a former Madison Trust project that's part of that campus pantry we talk about. What they do is it's a pro program where they accept donations from folks um, of gently use career clothing they do buy some new clothing um, through donations that they receive through off-campus living and it's actually a pop-up it moves around campus they advertise it for students and students can come especially around career fair time and times where we know activity in career and academic planning where there's a high number of on-campus interviews so it bounces around so these students that don't have a piece of clothing can go find it is that okay mm -hmm. So that's the answer. And then now for you, from Brendan Hughes, how successful have similar programs been in the past with placing high school students in local jobs? <coughs> that's a good question. I haven't done this before, so I don't know. I don't know no. if you've had. We haven't done it. We've done a lot of work with dual enrollment with high school students, partnering JME students with high school students, but never in a job atmosphere. So this is brand new and we feel really excited about it and looking forward to it, and we think it's going to be great. And I think we're really thrilled, too, because we worked directly with Rebecca to figure out what the need was and where there was really a gap that we could kind of step into. So um, I think we're excited to take on something new with her and her program. Yes, it's because of Rebecca we took the path that we ended up taking on this. We were going down a different direction, but we went right to the source and said, what do these high school students need? And she flat out said they need resume writing, job interviewing uh, prep, and CV, CV write, um, composing. So we got it from the expert, and that's, that's where we're going with it. I, it. Rebecca's not unknown on campus. She got something akin to this going into computer science as well, where her husband teaches. Thanks, Bob. Other questions? Thank you. All right. Thank you all so Thank much. You very much.
Good afternoon. Thank you all very much for having us. Uh, we're here to talk to you about something very near and dear to both of our hearts, uh, to serve those who have served and the JMU Valor program. So our goals are to take the work that began here on campus in 2012 and take it to the next level. We want to guide our students through the business side of their time at JMU. We want to support their transition to this campus. We want to create a sense of home and comfort for them while they're here through our Veterans Lounge and all across our campus. We want to provide comprehensive services for them and provide for their unique needs. We want to educate the rest of the community about our veterans, who they are, what they've done, how they've served them, and how we can now provide that service back. We also want to expand our programming throughout the year. There are things we can do for these students to bring them together, but also to bring them into this community. Then we will support them as they transition from, from JMU after graduation. Where we are today is after the work of many, many people after Provost Jerry Benson created a group back in 2012 to come together and provide support to this community. In November of this past year, late November, the team came to me and said, can student affairs take this? We've taken it as far as we can. We need to go farther and do more. And I accepted that and have been working ever since with our students to create this opportunity for our students. So we're starting to create our support systems across campus. We've been meeting with the Veterans Scholars Task Force. I'll be meeting individually with each member. The Student Veterans of America chapter is a registered student organization here and active on campus. The Veterans Lounge and the Student Success Center is a home for these students where they can gather. And then we host several events each year, including the Memorial Day flag display on the quad. Where we want to go for this spring, anyone that knows me knows that I tend to be pretty aggressive, so we have pretty big goals already for this spring. We are creating the Jamie Valor Office. That's what we're going to call this, this group. Valor is an important theme for these students. We want to establish a student staff presence. We already have. She's next to me. We've hired Denise to work with us this spring, in the summer, and then I hope to have her as a grad student next fall. We're going to have focus groups with all veterans, inviting all of them to small group conversations to talk to us about their experience and see how we can better serve them. We're working with the bookstore who's agreed to help us create a hat that we can sell and we'll get the proceeds back to serve the veterans through those sales. We're also going to connect with ROTC. We have an amazing ROTC program here on this campus. Those two communities should connect and should be vibrant together as they grow. We also plan to host several events this year, a barbecue and a graduation celebration as a minimum so that we can celebrate the, those that are graduating and moving on. We're gonna take what was the task force and create an advisory board to help bring liaisons from all across this campus together to serve. We're also going to be improving our services and resources in the Veterans Lounge. We've already added a number of different things, mostly at the help of partners from across campus. Administration and Finance is buying us a refrigerator. Registrar just bought us two computers and a printer. And then we've been going to Costco and buying food and other things so that there are items in there to welcome the students when they come in the space. And last, I've asked my division to step up. We've gathered money to buy some identity items for this community. So when they come back in the fall, they'll have t-shirts, hats, pins, challenge coins, so they can become a community and identify each other on campus and make what can, for them, be a large campus feel smaller. There we go. So in the future, where we want to go in the next two years, establishing the graduate student position that I mentioned, every relevant office across campus, and we'll be providing support and community for our military dependents. While most of our students involved in this are actually dependents, we are focused on all that are involved, both active military, dependent, and our veterans. So I want to pass it off to Denise Frisky to talk to you about what the veterans experience is like at JMU. In the military, two main things are instilled into your head. Be aware of your surroundings and blend in. This becomes a problem for us as we transition back to civilian life. Blending in as it is an issue as non-traditional students, sorry, as many of us are non-traditional students. We're older, we have families, and very different life experience from a traditional student. For example, I'm 35, married with three kids. Our life experiences and training make us hypervigilant of our surroundings. When we enter classroom, we look around to find that one desk that will give us the best, best tactical advantage if things go south. This constant need to be ready isn't something most traditional students have to deal with. These different life experiences can make it harder for veterans to connect, to connect with other students. Fortunately for us, JMU has a student veteran lounge 
This lounge allows us to connect with other veterans that have similar life experiences and may be struggling with the same things. I was discharged from the Navy for generalized anxiety disorder, classified as depression. Meeting new people is not an easy task for me, but through the lounge, I've met other veterans who are dealing with the same struggles. One of the veterans I met at the lounge is my friend Jacob. Jacob has become someone who I can call any time when I'm struggling just to make it through the day. Without this safe place for veterans to connect with other veterans, I never would have met Jacob and I don't know if my college experience would be the same or as easy. JMU needs a support system for veterans. We need people who can anticipate our needs, who understand we no longer know how to be a student, as it's been many years since most of us have had formal education. We are out of the routine of studying, signing up for classes. Veterans would benefit greatly from an office that's here to support us and tell us what services are available to veterans. Because if there's one thing about veterans, it's we hate to ask for help even when we need it the most. So what we're here to ask for is to get us started. Uh, I'm committed in the next two years to identify the funds to support this community and build this for years to come but that can't happen quick enough. And these students deserve us to serve them better now. So what we're asking for is you to help us get through the next two years until I can pull the money together from my own division to fund this. This is a plan and a priority for student affairs to fund this program fully. I can't do it quickly enough with our budget cycles to do that. So as you see here, what we're, what we're presenting today, uh, personnel, a GA stipend for Denise. Uh, another support has come from academic affairs who've covered the entire tuition stipend for, for the next two years. Uh, the National Conference, so we can send more students to that conference, that is where they connect with other veterans, but also where they connect with future career opportunities. Programming, you'll, you can identify there, our orientation, barbecue, veterans games for both football and basketball I mentioned before, as well as the graduation celebration. And then Green Zone, which is a training we wanna to begin to offer widely across campus to faculty, staff, and students so they can understand the veterans' experience and be supportive of our veterans. And last, the identity items that I mentioned, so we can provide that opportunity for our students to connect with each other, see each other. And the way I describe this is I want the first day of class to happen. I want a veteran to walk into a room feeling the way Denise talked about. I want them to see someone else wearing the student veterans Jamie Valor t-shirt and say, this room is now two people, not 150 people. They deserve that moment of comfort and feeling like, yes, I belong in this room and someone else knows my life, even if they've lived it differently. So that brings us to the End of this, um, we have a right and a responsibility to honor those who served. Uh, I appreciate your willingness to work with us. We're committed to these students and have made significant strides already only in a few months. We want to do more and we want to do it faster before I can get the funding together within Student Affairs. And I expect to be the model of service advocacy and support to veterans, independence, and active military by 2025. As I noted, I'm rather aggressive. Uh, and personally, as a, as a child and as someone married to a military family, this is personal. Uh, I, this is doing working directly with me. I'm not passing this off. This will report to the Vice President for Student Affairs until it's fully established, and then we'll put it in another location within the division that makes the most sense with our other identity groups. So with that, we'll pause, and thank you very much for your time. It's already there. We have the Veterans Lounge and the Student Success Center, one of the most, I call it Main Street. JMU's Main Street is Student Success. We already have a space in there and we'll be actually turning a room that's not all that well used within that space into the office for Denise and the staff of JMU Valor. And so the budget includes financing for that as well? That's already paid for. Okay. Everything's already there. All I'm doing right now is trying to find a desk, <laughs> which I will find. Please. Go ahead. What are the lessons learned over the history of veterans coming to Madison and then ultimately JMU? You look at the first male students were veterans coming back from World War II as day students. Then you look at the late 60s and 70s, the uh, veterans are coming back from the Vietnam War. And now you look at today's veterans that have served and are now coming to a college campus. What have we learned from those, um, those experiences and how uh, we address those needs, how we uh, uh, make them feel a part of the community, uh, not just when they arrive, but ongoing. What have we learned and what are some of the things that you take away from that experience, maybe not personally, but knowing of that history that is applicable now as we look at 
this this latest generation of veterans perhaps coming coming to and hopefully staying and graduating from JMU. Sure. I'll share my thoughts and if you have anything you want to add, Denise. Number one is this is not a monolithic community. We have to think of all 150 of these veterans as different individuals with, individuals with different needs, which is why we need a set group of people doing that work. Why we need someone who lived that experience in that office helping us do that. We can't just say, oh, we're gonna do this one thing and that's gonna work for all 150 veterans. It's not. One, someone with, and I have this experience from my previous institution where I ever saw veterans work there. You have to provide things that are right for family, veterans with families, single veterans, veterans that are younger, veterans that are older. We have to really look at this as 150 different individuals. And then you take in the dependents and active military as a whole other group. The individuality is gonna be key to how we do this. We can't just say, we did four events, that's enough. So I think that for me is the most important one is that you cannot just label these are the veterans and this is their place. Because for example, for some students, they love the veterans lounge. Others don't feel comfortable. So we have to do, provide multiple different places and different homes, which is why we want to do the veterans map of campus. So they can say, oh, I know Nick Swartz and Jennifer Taylor, who've been the ones leading this. They have offices, I can go to them and talk to them. Because someone might rather talk to Jennifer or Nick rather than me or Denise. We need to identify, identify all these different homes for students to find. I think you said okay. very well. Thank you. You answered my question. Thank you. Right. Tim, is this something new to, to campuses like across the state or the nation, or has or this already been done in other places and you're, you know, we're trying to kind of model their program? It has been done lots of other places. I'm using uh, my experience at George Washington University and I actually have a meeting with Notre Dame's Veterans Coordinator next week. And I'm actually going to my national conference for student affairs next week and I'm going to an all day seminar on Saturday uh, run by three different universities that already have really solid veterans programs. So we know each other well enough, you know how I mean this. I'm excited to go learn from them and steal from them and do better than them <laughs> with what we learn. I didn't see anything that spoke to um, a connection on social media, social media to establish a cohort. I would assume that that's part of the plan in some way, shape, or form, and is that part of the budget? Uh, yeah, and that will be pretty cheap, to be honest. Um, we'll probably have eventually get a student that will run most of that for us day to day. Uh, I'm pretty active on social media here on campus and really engaged in that way, so I expect to be able to elevate ourselves pretty quickly in that way. Um, I also know for a lot of our students, and this goes to the earlier question, some want to connect with us there, some want to talk in person, some want to talk in private, some want to be in groups. So we're going to have to use every method available to us. Some will read email, some won't. So we'll have to use every method. But yeah, social media will absolutely be part of it. Yes. Do, do you foresee having activities that uh, bring the balance of the student body involved, getting involved in, uh, and uh, being educated by it? You know, that, that, I, I'm not wording this properly. Or, I think I'm with you, but, yeah. but there's a learning experience for those that have not been veterans, and there's a the stereotyping of what is a veteran or not a veteran. Not every family is, you know, used to experiencing somebody coming back from war or whatever. Yes, I think first, I don't think many students even know that there are veterans here. Mm -hmm. So I think there's often a surprise moment when they run into a veteran and they didn't realize it. Uh, so we have to do that education piece. That's also why when we do these larger events where we say at a football game, these are the veterans at JMU, and at a basketball game, these other places, but also the green zone training that we wanna do across the board. We need to educate our students that, one, just that they exist, and then how to work with them and know them and respect them. I see, because I was thinking that honoring somebody at a ball game, that's terrific, they stand up and they're sold and they're bought, but you have to actually have a chance to interact with them. And say that's, yep. Not a guy with two heads. Right. And I think our first challenge is that there's just not even a knowledge that they exist. I mean, if you asked 100 students and said, do we have veterans at JMU, 99 would say, not that I know of. So there's education. Then there's what do you do with that knowledge and how do you connect with them? I do think ROTC is going to be one of our biggest connection points there because they have some level of understanding of it. So you start with that community, then they know we grow from there. Okay, two questions from Zoom. John Reeves Snyder asked, can you please clarify on your budget? You had the $25,000 total ask, 
then you mentioned that academic affairs is covering 9250. So does that mean your ask is actually 15750 or is it that? I'd already pulled the 9250 out. Okay. Yeah. And then the second question is from Ron McKay. Um, number one, thank you for your story, Denise. He wanted me to put in there. And then he said, Dr. Miller, can you elaborate on what unique value the National Conference provides? How would that be different from a JMU Veteran Career Day held on campus? I'm going to let Denise answer that because she has been multiple times. Yes, I actually did my undergrad here at JMU. I graduated in 2018. Um, I got the opportunity to come back to work on my master's. I was extremely excited to jump back on board with that. I've been to the National Conference twice now. I went once as an undergrad, once as a grad student. Um, it is the largest gathering of student veterans in the United States. And those people that they're at the career fair are there specifically looking for veterans to work with their companies, to better their companies. We get job offers at these career fairs. We walk out knowing that we have a place when we graduate. We also get to meet with other students that have you know, a more booming student veteran population than we do, and we get to go pick their brains and get different ideas about what we can bring back to JMU to make this better community for us. Um, you get to go and you get a bond and you get to hear other people's stories and really make lifelong connections from this. Another thing I would add to that is a presence at that conference that we've not had but we will have also will become a recruiting tool for us to get more veterans to come here. By being there, you are recognized as a place where veterans are honored and served and that will increase our veterans percentage, which is one of my goals. Uh, we should be a place where veterans want to come because they know how they will be treated and honored here on this campus. Denise, I've got a question. Um, when we uh, purchased Harrisonburg High School and we uh, had Veterans Memorial Field was part of that, it was a baseball stadium, and we worked carefully with the AMVETS and the VFW and the American Legion and the POWMIA um, riders to talk about you know, their vision for what could be meaningful. And we ended up creating Veterans Memorial Park for base baseball and softball, but we also built the, the memorial um, there um, for veterans of all foreign wars, wars from Harrisonburg and Rockingham County who were killed in action. Um, and at that time, there was a pretty active veteran community involved in those conversations with us as the university. I'm just curious, how connected are those community veteran groups to student veterans um, from, a, from a community student standpoint? So my mom's actually part of the Riders um, here in Harrisonburg. She's with the American Legion, the VFW. Um, we go to that canon celebration every time that they have it. But unfortunately, we don't get too much time to spend with the VFW or the American Legion. I know they have reached out several times and they're very interested in having us, getting us to be more involved in their clubs. Um, they've also offered us their space, their halls, to be able to host any activities that we would like there. So it's a great area for growth for us. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tim and Denise. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you all.
Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Maybe a first in the history of Madison Trust that we're running ahead of schedule. No, I think that's presentation. Well done, Mr. McAfee. <laughs> 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 you all are very kind. <laughs> you are very <laughs> kind. <laughs> so please welcome Dr. Michael Stewart to talk to us today about the future of music. Yep. Yes. Hello, uh, my name is Ben Guerrero. Um, I'll also be presenting. And before we talk about the future of music, I'd like to talk about the current uh, state of music. I'm a percussionist, a drummer, and um, a student going through a public music program. Public school music program will typ typically have elementary, then secondary, um, very performance-oriented um, music programs. And if they wanted to, they can get a uh, bachelor's in, in music education and then go off and teach. Uh, one thing about music performance is it's, it's a very narrow, specialized field, and there aren't always transferable skills. Uh, unfortunately, there's high turnover rate in uh, music education and actually kind of the music industry um, overall. And um, there's other paths that are available. Um, I was fortunate enough to come from a musical family. I had access to a lot of music technology um, and access to multiple instruments. And because I had that early curiosity in technology, I was able to go then get my master's in music technology. And I did uh, you know, app development for my master's thesis. Um, I went to Berkeley College of Music uh, for my undergrad. And um, I'm working on my PhD right now at Eastman School of Music, where I'm focusing research on music technology use in music education. And, uh, why this is important is because there are a lot of skills that could be learned while learning music. Um, professionals uh, in music, uh, if they don't have transferable skills to go from one industry to the next, um, paying for, for college and getting that return uh, on investment and not getting, um, you know, making sure that they are able to make a living doing music and there's other tangential careers other than just music education um, and, and right now music uh, education is still very much focused on western european music so the content is not very relatable and there's music skills that are not taught like composition arranging improvisation imagine you took an english class and you weren't asked to compose in a, in a composition book and write your own essays. And the focus was just to recite Shakespeare. Uh, that's kind of what the current state of music is in terms of let's play a lot of Bach and Beethoven, which is important, but asking students to be creative and use their creative skills elsewhere um, is not currently a focus. So we want to um, basically uh, move against the status quo and um, make sure that students are representing themselves in music. Um, so uh, someone who plays third clarinet, second trombone, uh, they're not going to have an opportunity to make their own music. They're always playing something else. Uh, the repertoire is narrow. And uh, right now, teachers are just you know, over tasks. And so that's where technology could possibly um, help, we want to resuscitate the future of music education. And so uh, with my expertise in music education and music technology, um, I've been fortunate enough to join this interdisciplinary dream team and work with people like Michael Stewart. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Ben. Uh, so I'm a computer science professor here at JMU, um, and I work in the area called human-computer interaction. 
In addition to that, I'm also um, you know, crossing those disciplinary silos, working together with music professors, music education research, but I'm learning some music sure. as well myself. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, both uh, the guitar and piano on my own, but also with my you know, children learning about music education. So um, we're both uh, have disciplinary expertise, but we're also looking at practicing and understanding of each other's fields. Um, so music CPR, this resuscitation that we hope to do with music education, um, is an online learning platform uh, that is free and it's research-based, okay? And so the approach of this at the absolute high level, okay, so we're saying online learning platform, we see this kind of dire state in music education. And so what we have are three kind of main parts to our strategy. All right, the first one is that we want to integrate transferable skills, just like Ben was saying earlier, um, to continue to focus on the passion of music and learning those things as you do now. But at the same time, you can actually do this in ways that start to build those transferable skills that can widen the tech talent pipeline and things like this. Um, additionally, as he said, it's very hard to see yourself in music when you're only performing, you know, only reciting Shakespeare, you know, on, in language arts. Um, and so let's start to see a bit more content in genres. Um, and then finally, um, let's take advantage of some of our computational resources um, to help those um, increasingly overburdened educators do more with less and to um, provide greater access to higher quality music education um, than is currently possible for, for many places. So with those three main pieces of our strategy, um, we think that they're really lined up very well to address various parts of those kind of uh, many problems that we identified, the transferable skills, you know, um, towards the return on investment of investing in maybe a major or um, a, a, a long life practice of music education, and then bringing in specifically um, recruiting new composers and compositions to study. And then finally, putting computation to work to really help get it more skills and um, helping to solve where funding is currently scarce um, to be able to do more um, through, through a little bit of uh, computation. So this is the past, present, and future of Music CPR. So um, there's kind of a minimum viable product on one end, pilot. We're about to move into the beta. And then the future, where we're really going to focus here in just a second um, with the support of Madison Trust, would be to get to our public kind of V1. So I just want to zoom in on this for a second. Um, <clears throat> so. Early on, we made the absolute you know, simplest prototype and uh, got into the classrooms. And so in this simple prototype, students record their performance of whatever you know, melody of a song that they've been asked to learn and um, sub, you know, submit this recording into a little system. Um, they compose music as well, moving away from strictly reciting and performing others' work into composing some of their own. Um, and then getting, uh, the, they would get their teacher's feedback. In this um, very early prototype, um, this was really focused primarily on band repertoire, and that's not through any intentional exclusion. We fully intend for this to be band and orchestra and generally um, music education altogether, and so that's going to be part of moving past our pilot. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in this early phase, we had over 200 students and over 12 um, teachers, and that's with lots of um, attrition as we move to um, remote only you know, in those classrooms um, during the pandemic. Um, <clears throat> So the beta that's currently heavily under development is kind of moving past bubblegum and duct tape early prototype and be something a bit more robust and usable for those teachers, um, brings in orchestra right away, and it starts to collect that data that's gonna help us to have um, a bit more of a value proposition longer term as we have more samples to provide to inform a music education. So this is um, heavily underway, um, and where we're trying to get to next is <clears throat> getting to those three main pieces of our strategy that really require us to have that baseline in place to make it adoptable for the teachers and students in the first place. Um, and so uh, this is where we would really uh, like to move now um, yeah, with, with, some, with some support into, from our beta to the um, public version. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, perhaps I could hand it back to you then. Yeah. Yep. So um, some differentiating factors uh, from what we're working on compared to what currently exists for, for different um, music software. Uh, one, uh, right now we, we want to make sure that this is free and accessible for both the students and the teachers. Uh, we want to make sure that the content is standards-based and research-informed. Um, and then, uh, you know, Scaffold's new pedagogical practices uh, like including popular music, including improvisation and, and composition. And then starts integrating computational thinking and literacy. Uh, that would be in that public uh, 1.0 version that uh, we would like to work on. Uh, this isn't just an app that's going to be for sale. Uh, this is current uh, active faculty research, um, and it's also been undergraduate and graduate student um, education and research. Uh, so we're not just throwing tech at the problem, which uh, you know, educational technology has 
a history of doing that sometimes. Uh, we are going to um, use a part participatory design so that the teachers are able to uh, inform the software development from the ground up. And uh, we're also using professional development to reach out to these teachers, get them to adopt um, this online platform. And then they are our future advocates. Um, and it's also uh, marketing for us. So like we said, we're on this uh, dream team. And um, yeah, yeah, sure. Why don't you take so it? yeah, we're, we're happy to be working on this from our two disciplines, but uh, here at JMU, <coughs> but of course we include collaborators at other places like Eastman, Virginia Tech and the University of Delaware. Mm -hmm. um, likewise, in even this first pilot where you're working with educators in the field in different contexts, public, private, um, homeschool co-ops where they can't have individual uh, music teachers mm -hmm. across different states. Um, as been, been mentioned, our approach is standards aligned. Those teachers are on the hook to be reporting on their progress on the standards of learning in their respective districts and all. And, there's, uh, and, and so this is um, part of our process to make sure they're able to do that easily as well. Um, we'd really like to see this be sustainable. In terms of improving access to higher quality music education, um, it's free right now, and that's how we intend it to stay. Um, but to, to sustain it requires some, some kind of investment for us to move first from this beta, which requires professional development to make sure we're understanding what teachers need, where is this working for them, where do they perhaps need some changes. Um, but once we can get to uh, a few iterations, having done that with those teachers and go to our public uh, mode, we can kind of enter a keeping the lights on mode, where really our costs remain relatively low just based off of hosting and things. Um, but during that time, as users grow and we have more students um, submitting work and professors uh, marking that work and things, um, our value compounds because now we're building up a huge labeled data set that we can leverage to improve the quality of music education for music educators and universities, which can then inform um, the teachers going into the field to do uh, music education. So, you know, with a little help from our friends, uh, we have started and been very thankful for lots of internal funding um, from JMU. So from um, the Center of Visual and Performing Arts, from my College of Size and the Faculty Senate generally, and also from four VA complementary funds working across with Virginia Tech, um, from NAFME as well. And then, you know, this is how we plan to move from the beta to our public uh, 1.0 is with some help from the Madison Trust. At, once we get to that point and that value continues to compound, we're going to be perfectly situated to then make um, asks of external agencies like the NSF to then um, go after the even um, like later uh, um, parts of the project that we're looking to do. So with that, thank you very much for your time and attention. I'm really excited to take your questions. Yeah, sure. Can, um <clears throat> I'm having a hard time picturing the next product. I understood the, the beta or the, the minimum viable product. What, what does the product look like now? Like what activities are the students doing that they're then getting feedback on? Yeah, so that's, so that's a great question. So <clears throat> um, are there mics for the participants to be heard remotely or I should repeat the question? No, they're good. Okay, um, so uh, music CPR, part of the name CPR is fun because we're gonna resuscitate something, but it's also um, because of the standards in music um, and, and other arts uh, are oriented around a framework for create, perform, and respond types of activities. It's exactly that setup that we're using in our activities as well. So the performing activities um, are where the students tasked by their teacher with a particular piece that they should be working on. They're gonna learn um, the melody of this piece and the baseline, so they'll rehearse some and then they'll record it. Importantly, in terms of increasing access, as we, this ran during the pandemic, right? So we've built this as a web application that requires very little resources of the machine that the student might be using themselves. So they're at home with their instrument just with that tablet or laptop or whatever's microphone. Um, that they should be able to perform, rehearse, and then decide that they want to submit that take. Um, and so they'll, they'll practice that with both the melody and the bass line. This is already beginning to diverge away from status quo in music education towards best practices, because instead of just learning the certain chair part of that big song, you're going to actually work with the whole melody or then later the whole bass line. So the performance piece looks like practicing and then recording some audio you know, that you perform. Then the create part. The create part says now you have practiced with this performance piece, uh, we would like you to compose a counter melody and and you know and as has been said composition is not really a part of the status quo music education and so this is a, a place where um, through the app itself we scaffold that new activity that we're asking students to do and their teachers in supporting them to do that kind of activity explaining kind of what it might look like to do so 
And so they, given the song they've just been you know, familiarized with, they'll compose this kind of counter melody and they'll share with other, you know, other students and the teacher and get some feedback. The last part, the, C, the R in CPR respond, they do a reflection activity. What was it like to go through this particular process? What did you think about your counter melody when you heard from the others? How do you rate your performance on the very same scales the teacher's gonna use you know, to mark that performance as well? That's the, that's the current um, version that is moving from kind of the early prototype into the full-on beta. Um, to get to some of those other points that we'd like to address with <clears throat> our overall um, transferable tech and new content and things, so one big piece of the transferable tech skills, uh, we're kind of coming at it from two directions. So computational thinking being one. So this has been a big push coming out of sort of CS areas to say, how, why should anybody ever even try it in the first place? And how will they be prepared for uh, jobs in this field? So one of, there, there's many sort of proto-computer science ways that you might think about, understand problems, or how computers are functioning. One of the big things that we can see in there is understanding that computers have to represent things from the real world in some way. As the student composes for themselves a counter melody, they know this note in this particular measure with certain beats, and they see that in the musical score, and they can uh, make that composition. What will reveal to them, kind of pull the covers back you know, and see the wizard after they've done the few activities and gotten comfortable with that task, is actually the computer's understanding this behind, this, this behind the scenes, okay? And we'll show them a programmatic view, right, that is intended for children. You know, block-based programming uh, would be a great way to visualize that. And we'll say, look, as you continue to add to your counter melody, watch how this other re representation happens. And then we can move towards eventually saying, okay, now what happens if you manipulate instead of the musical representation itself? Manipulate that programming-based uh, view and see how that is affecting in turn the score, and, and get back and forth and start to, you know, so this is an application of educational technology that helps you do music. How is it doing that? Someone's building it. How did they think of how music should be represented, you know, and, and to move in that direction? That's one side. The other side is just to be a sort of weekend um, composer and performer that you might like to sell some tracks online or something like this. You really have to be able to record, master, um, publicize your tracks to be bought. Just simple literacy that is not the general literacy of participating in technological society, but that is around music could be very valuable. So one piece of the next step that is um, in this uh, milestone that is trying to help us to build the classroom climate between students and teachers is taking those first performances where they might submit their rehearsal of the melody to a particular song, and now instead of directly handing it to the teacher, it goes to the next student in the small group. They'll play now instead of on top of the accompaniment alone, on top of their classmate who they know who they are, and they can round robin for a little while. Perhaps when I see how my third, fourth classmate in my mm -hmm. small group has done, I think I might want to retake mine actually on this thing. Um, but in doing so, the trombone was super close to the Chromebook when that person submitted and the kazoo was really far away. So maybe we need to not just be letting the computer record things on us, but take some control and agency in that interaction, start doing leveling and things um, to, to move towards the digital kind of mastering and, and, and audio workstation that they need to know the, at least the basics of to continue lifelong music. Yeah, thanks. Um, I want to say just one other thing in terms of the big picture <laughs> in that last bullet point. As the teachers are listening to the audio files of the students and grading, assessing those students on that rubric, that's metadata that's being added to the audio file so we know what a proficient sixth grader sounds like, a proficient eighth grader sounds like a big data set like that currently does not exist and is currently not used in any music education software at the moment. So uh, in terms of future future, once a, a large data set is created, there's uh, a lot of possibilities of what we could do with that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. Good. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for the presentation, it's awesome. Uh, and, and especially kind of talking about the concept of what this, uh, especially explaining with the kind of the English literacy. Uh, just a quick question in terms of, I'm thinking about in terms of like the demand or the market research in terms of, uh, it, it sounds like it's great, you know, how you kind of explain through this, but is there some where you're feeling that there is the demand for this? Is somebody, you know, is there research in terms of people are saying, hey, we want this or, you know, uh, or, or that, that there's some kind of uh, survey that, that that there are people are looking for this? Uh, in terms of um, music education technology, it's exploded over the past 15 years. Um, there was one company uh, that, that made software called Make Music, and it was, you know, late 90s, early 2000s. It was just, um, it wasn't used a lot. And then once things started moving to the web, um, there's probably 
um, at least eight competitors that have come up in the past 10 years. And um, as far as I know, uh, machine learning is not in any of those. Not just machine learning, I mean, competitors oh, with oh each yeah. other, right? But yeah. as Ben said in yeah. an earlier slide, we have several things about our approach that are yeah. novel, that are pretty different than those things on the market. And in terms of people asking for it, um, the teachers are on the hook for individual assessment of students. In a math class, I can ask a student to please take a test each individually in the room. And what do I do now with 50 students in a band classroom to individually assess them, you know, as the band director or orchestra? Um, so this is something that's very difficult, perhaps not really something that they can really do. They sort of nod to those um, requirements right now. And this helps them um, to be able to get that work done um, of individual assessment. Right. And you have gotten the feedback that that's something they're looking yeah, for. With, yes. the, with something yes. that honestly, as a, as a user interface right. person, I, I would have so. yeah. Yeah. Uh, scratched my microphone. I would have argued would have been unusable, in fact, in an early prototype, but we have to try something out and go somewhere. They're clamoring. When yeah. are we having the next tracks in here? When can we add the orchestra, et cetera? They are really excited to go with this. Um, perhaps it was uh, dropped through the speed of the presentation. We have at least 600 students waiting for this beta to drop um, across those same states and, and more institutions. So th thank, you, thank you for the question. I'm fascinated by the, the potential if you look at the vision, maybe your vision for this program, but also the life cycle of JMU students. So you, early in your presentation, you talked about what attracts students to maybe the music education. So opening up entirely new fields that you maybe thought, I don't want to be the traditional music teacher, but I could see myself doing this. Mm -hmm. It plays more, no pun intended, or every pun intended, plays more to my skill set. But likewise, if you look down the road, ultimately, if you are attracting students that are interested in this kind of, 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 of career, then you're also going to have JMU graduates that are then going to be out in the field that will be receptive to this because they came up through the system. So ultimately, you're going to create your own network of JMU graduates, if not from any other place, just JMU graduates, then are going to be receptive to the next generation and beyond the beta, et cetera, for that. So have you, have you talked or thought a, a much about the vision for where this might go, both on the front end in recruiting students to music education that may not have thought of it as a, career, a viable career, as well as that loop if you look at the, the full cycle? Yeah, I know uh, one thing, the, in the School of Music, the music education uh, degree is the uh, largest uh, program within the School of Music. Um, and I already know and have talked to uh, JMU, JMU alumni, music education, that are now um, teaching entire music technology classes. And um, previously there hasn't been a blueprint for that. Um, we, uh, it, I'm in the music education department. Uh, we've just recently added a jazz track focus in music education. And we're, we're talking about adding additional uh, foci under the music education degree, including music technology. Other, other ways that we expect this to propagate is that as those te the transferable technology skills are being included in music education with new genres, perhaps more students would continue in music education in the first place. And as they continue with that passion and enjoy it, they learn that actually also a lot of what they're doing applies to other fields than just music. So while they may choose to continue to learn and educate themselves in that discipline that they love, they actually may not have to require of themselves that the return of investment of their time and degree and interest is necessarily as a professional musician. They can continue to their music practice and perhaps they can work in a technology field going towards that widening of the tech talent pipeline that we think is possible through the, this approach as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, to, to sort of bolster and, and answer uh, the question about whether or not, you know, how many people want it, um, my son, was there's a system that the school made him play during the the pandemic where he played the same thing over and over again he had to hit the right tempo the right note depending on what microphone he had how close he was to it and everything else so it's apparently being utilized just very poorly right now through all sorts of systems uh so it, it you know something that's more interactive is, is a departure from what they're utilizing at least in our house over and over again <laughs> 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 if only for Paul's sanity, I've right. else. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So for
for our folks on Zoom again. We are going to take a break for you all to be able to talk to our last three presenters. So our folks on Zoom will get a chance to ask questions they didn't get to ask now. For those of you folks in the room, we would ask you to feel free to take a break. And please be back here by 345 for the next session with Dr. Langridge. Live stream, want to say thank you to you all who watched the live stream today, and we will be in touch with you over the next few days about how you can support the projects you saw today. And thank you again for watching, and good day.